Chris Gems, Camden Yards in Baltimore, ESPN's Wednesday Night Baseball, the Orioles and Tigers. In 1982, Spiky Anderson said, if you have to choose between power and speed, you've got to go for speed. Spiky's apocalypse now is that power has its advantages. Power has taken the Detroit Tigers to number one in the American League East. Meanwhile, Baltimore manager Johnny Oates could only grimace. The Orioles, playing sloppy baseball earlier this season, got off to a terrible 5-13 and 13 start. They were the overachievers last year, but they were quickly becoming this year's major disappointment. But hang on. The Orioles have now won 15 of their last 18, and they are on a run to the top. Standing in their way, however, the cannon power of Cecil Fielder and the Detroit Tigers, next on ESPN. The Detroit Tigers used their power last night to take an early lead against the Baltimore Orioles. This home run by Travis Fryman, this one by Mickey Tettle. And the Detroit Tigers built on those home runs a 7-1 lead. But the Baltimore Orioles, in one of baseball's great comebacks, ultimately won the game. Chris Hoyle's two home runs, including that grand slam. It is an absolutely perfect night for baseball. Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, the Detroit Tigers and the Baltimore Orioles at Game 2 of their series. There is a pennant race underway. So says Sparky Anderson in the American League East. Detroit lost the game to Toronto and to Baltimore last night. Hello, everybody. Gary Thor, delighted to have you with us and welcome. The Detroit Tigers, like all of us, may love the aesthetics here, but they sure don't like playing here. 0-7 last year, now 0-8 over the last two seasons. Buck Martinez joining me here tonight for Detroit, a devastating loss last night. It sure was, Gary, and it's the first time the Tigers have been in this situation where they have to bounce back from a tough loss. Catcher Mickey Tettleton says he could feel it slipping away last night in the fourth inning. Things just didn't seem right, but this is a character ball club. Got a lot of veterans on it. They should be able to bounce back. A great win for the Baltimore Orioles last night. Also with me tonight, Peter Gammons. Peter, for Baltimore, a chance to really make some hay. Okay, this is an extremely important home stand for them, not only because they're playing the three teams in front of them in the standings, but they've got to start hitting home Home runs. It's a team predicated on power. The spring training, they said, we're going to have seven or eight guys hit 20 home runs. Well, right now, they've got two in double figures, and not one of them has 28 RBIs. Well, they had a game last night that you can build on all the rest of the season. They'll be remembering their comeback win. It was their 20th of the year. Will they have to do it again tonight? Well, we're going to find out. Settle back. Detroit Tigers, Baltimore Orioles coming up. Well, I'm Tom Meese. In a moment, the Tigers and the Orioles from Camden Yards. Let's quickly catch you up on the other action around the majors on this Wednesday afternoon slash evening. Kenny Lofton in the bottom of the first for Cleveland. It gets over Tom Brunanski's head in right field for Milwaukee. Brunanski fumbles it with Lofton's speed. That's a lot of trouble. Guess what's going to happen? You got it. Inside the park, home run is the ruling for Kenny Lofton. And the Indians are out early on Milwaukee. This afternoon, the White Sox won again. There you see the remainder of the schedule tonight in the American League. In the National League, a couple of day games. Phillies won. Montreal won as well. The Giants win again. Look what Colorado's doing to Cincinnati. The other three games either just getting underway or are scheduled later on tonight. But what a good one we should have tonight from Camden Yards. The Tigers and the Orioles. Let's go live now to Baltimore and Gary Thorne, Buck Martinez, and Peter Gann. Tom, thank you very much, Ed. Welcome back, everybody. Sparky Anderson going after Walter Alston's mark as the fifth winningest manager he can time if the Detroit Tigers can pick up a victory tonight. First, Sparky Anderson's Detroit Tigers, our Energizer starting lineup. Among the top ten hitters, Tony Phillips leading it off. He'll be in left field. Another one of those great hitters, Lou Whitaker at second base, bat second. Travis Fryman, the shortstop, will be batting third. Power supreme, Cecil Fielder at first base. Comeback player of the year, maybe that man right there, Kirk Gibson. Peggy Tuttleman following him in the lineup. He's getting the dingers. Rob Deere looking for them in right. Scott Livingstone will start at third. And in center field, Dan Glenn. On the mound for the Orioles, right-hander Rick Sutcliffe, seven and two. This is his first start in eight days after serving that five-game suspension for the June 6 brawl with the Mariners. 
Sutcliffe doesn't have the same velocity he's had in the past. 14 home runs. That compares to 20 throughout the entire season last year. You can see that the long ball has been a problem for Sutcliffe. But he'll move it around, change speeds, come from the side from time to time. Still has decent movement and really relies an awful lot on reading the hitters and how they're reacting to his pitches. Defensively, the Orioles stack up like this. Brady Anderson's normally in left field, but he's out with the chicken pox. This is a young Orioles club, but I didn't expect the chicken pox to knock Brady Anderson out. Mike Devereaux, outstanding center fielder. Mark McLemore's done a great job in right for Johnny Oates. Gomez and Ripken on the left side. Reynolds and Sugi on the right side. And Chris Hoyles doing most of the catching this year for Johnny Oates' Orioles ball club. Uh, you now, Buck, there's been a lot of talk about Cal Ripken leading the All-Star balloting. Even in Baltimore, they're saying, hey, it should be Travis Fryman. He's got, hitting 60 points higher. He's got better numbers in home runs and RBIs. But shortstop is still a defensive position. Cal's got less than half as many errors as Fryman. He's still a great defensive player. We'll have a chance to talk about that as we move along tonight. Cal Ripken, I think, getting a little concerned about the situation himself at this point. Sutcliffe ready to go. Tony Phillips stands in. And the switch hitter takes it upstairs. Ball one. We are underway. 85 degrees to start this game. You see Tony Phillips third in the league as far as average is concerned. Second in walks and third best on base percentage in the American League. Just a great leadoff hitter. Deep in the box on Sutcliffe. Takes it up high. This is not unusual. We'll be watching this all night long. We've got a couple of pitches working tonight. <laughs> Number one. They nibble around the strike zone, and number two, they take a long time to do it. <laughs> we'll see if they hold true to form here on this one. You know, Gary, when you don't have that good velocity, it's even more important for you to pitch ahead. Pitch ahead, because you can't throw that fastball by hitters any longer. And there's the strike. Tony Phillips taking all the way. Two balls and one strike. Both now. Sutcliffe and Moore don't have the velocity they once had, so now they have to pitch a little more, but you're always better off if you can pitch ahead. It's working seven and two for him. Outstanding start for Sutcliffe. Remember, he's working now on the eight days rest because of that five-game suspension, the brawl on June 6th against Seattle. He missed the start he would have had on Sunday. And there is Tony Phillips's number. We were talking about it on base percentage. And add another little digit onto that one. Sutcliffe has now walked 46 batters in 88-plus innings. 46 walks and 43 strikeouts. That walk total is a terrible number when you mix it with 14 home runs. And the 7 and 2 record. Wait a minute. <laughs> You're not supposed to be able to do that. Well, that'll catch up to him. Lou Whitaker stands in. Whitaker, you see the great numbers he's putting up. He right now has a six game hit streak as he comes into this game. Tony Phillips will be held at first base. All kinds of things can happen here. Hit and run, the steal, the bunt. Lou Whitaker can handle the bat. Whitaker has laid down four sacrifices thus far this season. Tony Phillips over there at first base has picked up eight stolen bases, eight for 15. Way up high on that one. And that's going to bring Hoyles out to talk to Sutcliffe. Basically, everything he's thrown so far in this ball game has been upstairs, and they've stayed away from the breaking ball early, and that might be the pitch that'll get him back down in the strike zone. When you throw a breaking ball, you have to follow through with your delivery and really complete the pitch, and that'll get you back downstairs. Chris Hoyles doing the catching. He has thrown out 18 of 49 for base stealers. Runner not going. Center field. Devereaux. Another half dozen short steps over, puts it away. And Whitaker's retired. Tony Phillips goes back to the bag. One away. Boy, what a night. I'm not sure the good Lord could have created a better day than what we had in Baltimore today. And you talk about a baseball kind of day. Ernie would have said, let's play four or five. Start about nine this morning. There's no humidity. It's 85 degrees. A gentle breeze was blowing right to left. The flag is now just up against the pole out there and it is absolutely perfect and they've got yet another packed house here in Baltimore Travis Fryman he's got a three game hit streak entering tonight's game Tony Phillips extending the lead at first Sutcliffe on the outside corner for the strike last season the first inning a real detriment to Sutcliffe 
He ended up last year going 0-10 in games in which he allowed a first inning run. Same thing has happened to him this year. If he does not get through this inning, he ends up in trouble. He can throw a lot of pitches in a hurry in the first because we were talking about the fact he has to find the strike zone and he wants it to be so small it takes him a while to find that nibble spot. Okay, this is such an important start for them because they're really concerned about Mike Mussina, I mean, who got hurt. He's been given up 16 runs in the 14 innings he's pitched since the fight. Players have said he's just not pitching inside. He's pitching much more tentatively, which is very unusual for a guy that cocky. And they really need Sutcliffe to come back and, and put off a string of wins if they're going to have Mussina out for a while. Three starts since that brawl we talked about earlier, and Mussina's ERA is 10.05. He's just talking to his teammates. He's just not throwing the ball, and there's no question that shoulder, something is wrong with it, and it happened in that brawl. I think the best read on Messina is the Tigers hitters. They said the velocity just wasn't there. He didn't have that aggressiveness. Travis Fryman waiting here. 1-1 one, one count, one down. Phillips, fourth throw. He has drawn from Rick Sutcliffe on this batter, so he's got Sutcliffe's eye. The other thing about Mussina that his teammates have noticed is ever since that incident in which he threw up and in, he has not pitched inside at all, and he's a master of that. He got knocked out in less than two innings in last night's game. Fryman takes the fastball inside, and the count goes to two balls and one strike. Well, we know right away Rick Sutcliffe is on his game. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing to first a lot and falling behind the hitters. Falling behind both hitters. Walked a guy. <laughs> Perfect game. Sutcliffe's going to win his eighth. We we're joking amongst ourselves here with these two pitchers, Mike Moore and Sutcliffe. Give up all the home runs and all the hits and all the walks. There are always people on base for these guys. Peter said probably have a two to one game, <laughs> hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> Tigers hit more home runs than anybody in American League. Sutcliffe and Moore give up more than everybody but Mike Gardner. They both gave up 14. Last year they both gave up 20. We were looking at these numbers of these two pitchers. It, it's a little bit scary. They are almost exactly the same, not only this year, but last year as well for these two guys. They both walk more than they strike out. They both give up the home runs. They both give up more hits than innings pitch, which is generally a no-no in this game. Yet Moore is five and three and Sutcliffe seven and two. Don't try and explain it. Just enjoy it. 2 2. Fryman down the third fouls it off. Off speed pitch that was up high. He was way out in front of that one. Two balls, two strikes. There are those dingers we were talking about. Mike Gardner's numbers are significant because he plays in maybe one of the toughest ballparks in the league to hit home runs out of. Royal Stadium in Kansas City. Sutcliffe and Moore both pitch in good hitters parts. 2 2 he got a hold of that one down the left field line Voight over and that's going to be a fair ball off the wall and over that short wall into the crowd that will actually save a run for the moment for Sutcliffe and the Baltimore Orioles Whitaker was the first out Fryman delivers the double second and third now occupied with one away 12th double of the year. Fryman's an outstanding young hitter, and he hooks that ball down into the corner. Jack Voigt's in left field. I don't think he really saw the ball that well off the bat, but it wouldn't have made any difference anyway. It was right in the corner and takes one hop over the wall for a ground rule double. This is the way the Detroit Tigers generally start games. They don't wait around. They lead the majors in runs scored along with home runs. They've got Fryman on with a four-game hit streak now. At second base, Tony Phillips on at third, and Cecil Fielder. Sutcliffe hit fastball low and inside to him, ball one. There are the big numbers for Cecil, who is third in home runs, tied for first in RBIs, fifth in walks. That's why his on-base percentage is so good, and of course the slugging percentage comes from all those home runs. He's batting 320 with runners in scoring position. Inside corner strike, one and one. Cecil set on the black, right on the corner. Questioning Dale Ford, the home plate umpire. The thing about pitching to Cecil Fielder, you can never get caught in a pattern. Take a look at his last pitch. Oils does a good job of holding it for Ford to have a real long look at it. 
They've got to move it around. You can't allow him to sit on something. Down to first. Runner coming. Phillips will score. Cecil Fielder gets the RBI as David Segui makes the play to first base. So, credit Cecil with yet another run batted in. And the Detroit Tigers take a one to nothing lead as Tony Phillips, who led this inning off with a walk, comes around to score. And as we said, Sutcliffe gives him up in the first. One nothing Detroit. But Sutcliffe's got a chance to get out of this here with no further damage if he can get the out right here, which, all things considered, wouldn't be all that bad. Kurt Gibson. Amazing. Those numbers for Gibson. After most people thought, I think he included, that he was probably out of baseball. Done. Well, you know what happened to him last year? He got away from it. He was released, went home. And the time off allowed his body to heal. He was pretty beaten up the last several years. And he got a chance to recuperate. Towards second base. Now Reynolds over. And that'll do it. So Sutcliffe does his usual magic here, even though he gave up the run. He leaves one on base, and it's a 1-0 Detroit lead. Cecil Fielder getting the RBI now leads the American League with 61 runs batted in, and Johnny Oates taking a look at the lineup card, saying, gee, I hope this isn't going to be like last night except for the result, but let's do it a little bit on the easier side. Energizer starting lineup. For the Baltimore Orioles, looks like this tonight. Darrell Reynolds will lead it off at second base. Mark McLemore starting in right field, a switch hitter. Cal Ripken struggling at the plate. Bats third at shortstop. Harold Baines, the designated hitter. Mike Devereaux in center field follows him. Chris Hoyles, the catcher. Big night last night, we'll tell you about. David Segui makes the start at first base. Leo Gomez, another home run hitter, is at third. Making the start in left field, Jack Boyd. Right-hander Mike Moore signed as a free agent in Detroit. I think he liked the run support he saw from the Tigers, and he's taken advantage of it this year. Almost six in the ERA department. This is his 16th start. Like Sutcliffe, he's allowed 14 home runs, and the control has been a problem. Mike Moore throws that split finger pitch, and it's caused a blister on his middle finger. He's been able to pitch through it, and just now it's beginning to be 100% again. Defensively, the Tigers are very versatile. Tony Phillips plays everywhere. Tonight, he's in left field. Dan Gladden was on a disabled list with a full quad muscle. So was Rob Deere. He had a neck problem. Livingstone at third base. Travis Fryman, one of the fine young shortstops in all of baseball. It's short. Lou Whitaker, the veteran, keep plugging along. And Big Daddy Cecil Fielders at first. Mickey Tettleton returns behind the plate now that Deere is back in right field. Well, there's Travis Fryman. He's got one of the great arms in the league. He's been inconsistent 17 errors, but the talent is tremendous there, and he is very much like his fellow townsman, Jay Bell, just a tremendous character player. A couple of pretty good positions he's played out there on that side of the infield. Moore gets the first pitch into Harold Reynolds, the second baseman. This great former Seattle Mariner. Now here with the Baltimore Orioles. Taken out of his position at second base there. Now playing it here. Whitaker. And Reynolds on the second pitch is taken out of there. One down. Dale Ford's working the plate tonight. Larry Young at first. Murray Weathers at second base. Rich Garcia at third. There you see the full house here in Baltimore yet one more time as they continue to, to pack them in here. No longer at an unprecedented rate. With Colorado now among Major League Baseball teams. Nothing's unprecedented unless it's in Colorado as far as numbers are concerned. They're already over 2 million. Moore off his glove. McLemore trying to beat it out. He does. Mike Moore is an outstanding fielder yet to commit an error this year and that ball comes right back to him and watch his reaction it takes him a while to find the ball goes off his glove then he looks for it and by the time he gets over to it and fires to first base McLemore had hustled down the line and beats it out so Mark McLemore will look into the sun along with Cecil Fielder it's all the sun that's left virtually on the field is right there at first base coming through the girders up on the upper level here 
It's a little tough for both. You see as he moves off, he's no longer in it. Now Cal Ripken. Runner at first base, base hit. Ripken, six hits in his last 32. Runner goes. Throw down by Mickey Tuttle on the money, but not in time. 14th stolen base. 14 out of 22 for Mark McLemore. It's a good break, but Mickey Tettleton is very deliberate as he comes out of the squat position, fires a strong throw, but you can see McLemore's hand beats the tag. Mickey Tettleton's just caught two out of 20 base runners now. You can see he was very deliberate coming out of the chute, has a strong arm, but it's just not in time to get McLemore. Now right away, Baltimore down one nothing, gets a runner in scoring position, McLemore. And Cal Ripken with an 0-1 count and one away. Mike Moore with a breaking ball misses outside to him. One ball, one strike. Peter, we were talking about Cal before the game. He was saying, I'm not going to embarrass myself and I'm not going to embarrass the team. He wouldn't say any more than that. But he's really getting concerned about how long does this thing go on about him having to play? Does it start hurting the ball club? Well, I think also, though, he knows that it's very difficult for him to prepare for a even to play in any way without being in the lineup. He's never done it his entire life. It's very difficult to start at this age right now. He's gone past the point where really an option of sitting him down for a game or two. Right back, hold the runner. Moore does. And Ripken retired on the comeback. One hopper, two down. Johnny Oates cannot take Cal Ripken out of the lineup, period. I don't think. No, I don't think so either. I think it's very difficult. I don't think it comes from up above. I think it just comes from the way the Orioles have been. I think it's very difficult for Cal to try to play by sitting down. And I don't think any of us can say, boy, it's a great thing for him because none of us can relate to what Cal Ripken's prepared for all his life. Well, Harold Baines gets the RBI opportunity. The designated hitter who's faced more a lot of times in his career. 11 for 47 Baines against Mike Moore 33 year old right hander the Scroogey down and away to Baines two down runner at second base Harold walks to the ballpark he lives on the other side of the big B and O station that's been converted out there for office space beyond the right field wall he's got a condominium and a building over there he is a Mallard, Marylander anyway. This is where he was born and raised up the road a little bit towards Washington, D.C. So he's got the condo here he can walk to. And then he says, we get a couple of days off. I go to my house. Not bad. Number four hitters. Out. That's where you want some RBIs generally to come from. Lanes with 20 runs batted in. More missing down and away. Orioles thought they were going to get some RBI production from Glenn Davis when they made that deal with Houston and he never panned out. And then they went out and got Harold Baines and he's a proven RBI guy, but he's had knee problems. Hasn't been as effective as he will be. The turnover pitch again by Mike Moore evens the count up at two balls and two strikes on Baines. That Davis deal has to be one of the worst ever. The three guys that gave up Harnish, Schilling, Finley, and they had to sell Mickey Tettleton to make up for the salary. Another owl. <laughs> <laughs> Detroit leading it one nothing here. Baines can tie it up with a base hit. He's got McLemore on at second base. 2-2 and it's a full count. For Harold Baines this season. 293 with runners in scoring position including one home run in those situations. For Mike Moore. Two three counts don't mean much to him. He'll go to him whenever he feels appropriate. McLemore will try and extend the lead at second base. Nobody holding him close. Three two to Baines. Sweet Lou. And that'll do it. So a runner, one hit, one left on. Mickey Tettleton will be coming up for the Tigers who lead it. One nothing. Five game suspension because of the brawl with the Mariners on June 6. He decided to serve it, so he's had eight days off. Why not appeal, Rick? The bottom line was that it really worked out better for our club uh, to go ahead and take it then because we could use the pitching that we had here available because of the off days. 
Whereas if I wait until August or September, whenever the date would have come up to appeal, we might have had to have called someone up from the minor leagues. And you never know. One game may cost us something down the road. So we figured we'd get it out of the way now. Pretty straightforward answer right there. Mickey Tettelin against Rick Sutcliffe. Tettelin, a six-game hit streak coming into this one. This is the quiet cannon. I sometimes forget exactly how much this guy's doing. That one ripped to center field. Tevero almost misjudged that one, but he got it. Tettelin out of there, one down. Tom Mees! Gary Thorne, we meet again at Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh. Tim Wakefield delivers, so does Derek May. This looks like a harmless single right. Whoops. Uh-oh. Orlando Merced let it go right under his glove. Mark Gray scores. Derek May goes all the way to third. And in the top of the first, the Cubs are on the board against the Buncos, leading 1-0 that game down the second inning. Gary? Saw that guy at the forum not too long ago, I think. <laughs> One down. Sutcliffe working to Rob Deere now, the right fielder, right-handed batter. Takes it outside for a ball. Here, yet another one of the power hitters. Also, of course, piles up the strikeouts like most of these big swingers of the Detroit Tigers. Not fair to say an all or nothing team, but you know, he has picked up nine home runs, 27 RBIs, 65 strikeouts. Let's just say they don't step in the box thinking about going to right. <laughs> <laughs> Not unless it's right out of the yard. Right? Towering pop up, second base. Meteorologists need her to handle that one. Reynolds hauls it in, and there are two down. Two down, nobody on. That'll bring up Livingstone. Other players who were involved in that brawl, Sagi for one, decided they would appeal. So they continue to play pending a determination on whether or not their suspensions will, in fact, be. Sanctioned. Sutcliffe going the other way with it. Interesting how different players approach it differently. The appeal process itself is quite interesting. Well, you're not going to get to tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless he drops the ball. <laughs> but Devereaux doesn't do that. Livingstone got him in a one, two, three inning, seven pitch inning right there. That catcher's coming up. By the name of Hoyles. Detroit Tigers leading it by a score of one to nothing. Cecil Fielder picking up the RBI and a ground ball out in that first inning. Back to work. Down the right field line. That's going to fall in and roll to the corner. Mike Devereaux on his way to second base. Ball gets lost in the corner. Deer over to get it. Gets it back in. And a leadoff double for Mike Devereaux, who has not been hitting the ball particularly well over the last two weeks. 15th double. Never went on the disabled list after he dove for a ball in the outfield and jammed his shoulder in his neck. So he's slow in getting that batting stroke back, but there does a good job of taking that outside pitch down into the right field corner. Look what Rob Deere has to contend with down in that corner. The wall just falls away from him. He goes down there, it bangs off that tin overhead door. He has to get it back in, but he holds Devereaux to a double. Don't you love those kind of corners, though? Old time baseball, isn't it? I love it. So leadoff man on at second base. That is the second hit for the Orioles off Mike Moore. And now Chris Hoyles. Chance for the RBI that could tie this ball game up. Infield stays back on him. What a night he had. A career night last night for Hoyles. Three for four. Two home runs including his third career grand slam. Six RBIs. Previous best night for him in RBIs had been four. He led Baltimore's magnificent comeback last night. It was the second best comeback ever with two down and no one on when it started in the sixth inning. They had been down seven to one in the game. They ultimately won the ball game by a score of 12 to nine. They put up eight runs in that sixth inning with two out and nobody on when it started. Boyle is waiting. Takes it down low. The major league record is 10 runs. With two down and no one on. The amazing part of that, Gary, was it was seven to four with two outs in a span of five batters and 24 pitches. It went from seven to four to eleven to seven. That's baseball in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> two ball, one strike count here. Moore 
Devereaux good speed at second base and Whitaker will move over to hold him close to the bag. This is an interesting at bat right here. Oils is looking for something out over the plate so he can hit it to the right side and move Devereaux along. But Moore has made a couple real good pitches with the fastball inside. Let's see if they both stick with their plans. Coyle's just red hot now. Six of, for his last eight. Right off the fist to third. Livingstone's got to go to first. And will move the runner up. So Hoyles grounds out. Livingstone making the play at third base, but Devereaux now with one away is on at third. Hoyles gets the job done, although that's not the way you'd expect it. No, and he really gets the benefit of a good piece of base running by Mike Devereaux. Generally, when the ball's hit on the left side of the infield in this situation, the base runner will hold his ground at second, but Devereaux knew that the third baseman was going to have to make the play, drawing him away from the bag, so he alertly went over to third base. So he's that much closer now with one away. David Segui, infield, has moved in. How about that? Second inning, a one-nothing game. After last night's game. Yeah, after last night's game, 12-9. Maybe Sparky knows something. I guess Sparky figures they used up all the runs they had last night. <laughs> it's going to be a 2-1 game, right? Tettelin going out. Talking about last night, look at the line in the ball game. That's some big-time offense right there. You see Gomez and Hoyles moving into the double-digit territory and home runs. The only Orioles right now in double digits with homers. Everybody in Detroit's in double digit. <laughs> now this is a hitter's ballpark, and you expect to have a lot of offense when you play here. Sparky expects a lot of offense wherever he plays. Runner at third base. All he's got to do is poke it through now. Sagi having himself quite a season. You know, Gary, there's been a big clamor in Baltimore to go out and get Fred McGriff. They talk about left-handed power. But David Segui's done a terrific job. He's an outstanding defensive first baseman. He's second on the team in slugging. He's in three, almost 380 with runners in scoring position. He's not their problem. Hit 233 last season. Has been with Baltimore now for parts of two seasons and then all of last year. Segui getting the opportunity to play regularly this year. And look what he's done. Runners in scoring position, and he's got one Devereaux at third base. Segui with a 357 average. With all due respect to Peter and Segui, he doesn't have the kind of impact that a Fred McGriff would have on the lineup of the Orioles. He would really take a lot of the pressure off of Cal Ripken to be the RBI guy now. And he could certainly take advantage of the short porch in right field here. I think McGriff fits better with the Orioles than any club in the American League. I think Cal Ripken has always performed much better when he's had so a good. partner to share some of the RBI load. When Eddie Murray was here, he had his big years. Sagi so fisted again. Interesting aspect of that about left-handed hitters in this ballpark. I was amazed to read the other day that wall in right field which when this ballpark opened last year many of us thought that scoreboard would become one of the most interesting areas in all ballparks in Major League Baseball all of last year 16 balls only 16 were hit off that wall which is kind of incredible that they and Baltimore had only half of those so they just don't have left handers pulling the ball and what they thought would be a good left handers area of the ballpark to either get it off the wall or get it out and over. So that's why I suppose the McGriff kind of discussion comes up. Huh? I think there are a lot of questions about that deal. First of all, San Diego had been asking for Jeffrey Hamlin's their highly talented center. They're not going to give him up. There are other player combinations that might work. But there's also the question about can they take on that kind of contract, four and a half this year, three and a half next year, with the ownership question up in the air, and the auction isn't going to come until early September. Two balls, two strikes, runner at third base, runner not coming. The infield was in. Whitaker looks it back. And Mike Moore gets what he needed. He's a ground ball pitcher. Devereaux had to hold with Whitaker right off the cut of the grass. And there are two down, and Devereaux still at third base. With the infield in, you've got to make sure that ball goes through, particularly at this point of the ball game. So Devereaux took a couple of steps toward home and then decided to hold his ground. All five Baltimore outs have been on ground balls. Mike Moore is a ground ball pitcher. Runner at third base now two down. Leo Gomez up. 
Infield now, of course, can back up. Gomez trying to get this game tied, but Baltimore not coming up with a big hit right now. You see the numbers for Gomez picking up home run number 10 in the ball game last night, but only four hits in his last 37 at bats. He too has struggled. This Baltimore team needs to find some offense. They found it last night. To short, Travis Bryan. That does it. Six out, six ground balls. Mike Moore getting it done. Lead off double by Devereaux, but he's left on at third base. Good job by Moore. One we're still looking for Hoot. Well, we think he may be around the ballpark, Tom, but we're not sure. We will keep you updated on that. Dan Gladden is here, number nine hitter. Was hit safely in the last four games he's played in. Did not play last night. Sutcliffe, off-speed pitch up high, ball one. Detroit leading one nothing. Got it in the first. Tony Phillips let it off with a walk. Travis Fryman picked up a double. Cecil Fielder brought home the run on a ground ball out. Sutcliffe missing down low with it. Falls behind two balls and no strikes. Sutcliffe four wins and uh, three losses against these Detroit Tigers. Sutcliffe is getting hit up this season despite the fact he's seven and two. One hundred hits and eighty eight innings coming into this game. Combine that with forty five walks one every other inning. You're talking about a lot of people on base. But what? he's one of those guys who works there. Yeah, here's a situation where a guy's six seven and there are a lot of moving parts in his delivery and he can get out of whack from time to time. Great major league career, 162 wins, 127 losses for Sutcliffe. Watch his right hand as it goes down by his hip and he really hides the ball from the hitter. Dan Gladden left center field, called in by Devereaux. Ball really staying up tonight. Devereaux has almost run under two of those line drives. They're staying up in the air rather than coming down. Dan Gladden retired, one away here in the third inning. Peter, you said you didn't think the problem was maybe McGriff for Baltimore. Is there an outstanding problem for this ball club? Well, I think that the, the ownership problem has to be worked out. I mean, they, it's, they thought they had the deal set with the Bill DeWitt group. But what's fascinating here is that that price was right around $120 million just weeks ago. Then they started bidding up. A, group, a local group of all sorts of people that come from Baltimore started bidding. It went up to 141. They put it up for a preliminary hearing yesterday. It jumped another six and a half up to 148 million. And there's some feeling that Gene Fugit, the former NFL tight end who runs Beatrice Corporation, may come in close to the $200 million that Eli Jacobs was seeking in the first place. But remember, franchises are bobbing out to uh, Buck. Yeah, they, <laughs> there, there's no place else for them to go. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? Everybody laughed when the original figure of $200 million was thrown up in the newspapers and in the press by Eli Jacobs to cover his debts, which run around $175 million, apparently. Nobody's laughing anymore. Tony Phillips fouls it off. Holds the count at two strikes. Let me give you a number for comparison's sake. The Toronto Blue Jays expansion fee was $7 million. <laughs> They're drawing 50000 plus a game. You know, other owners in baseball claim that the Orioles are even more profitable than the Blue Jays. They say this is the most profitable franchise in professional sports right now. It's a of And they wonder why. Fans wonder why, and legitimately so. Players draw the monies they do. I mean, you, you really do have to look and say, when ballparks look like this, and you're out there watching the game on television and the revenue is coming in from TV, there may be a lot of crying going on in some places, but there's a lot of money changing hands. Look out, caught him at third. Ooh, Trzuski. You usually see him get out of the way. He didn't on that one, and he's going to take a lot from the team on that. <laughs> you You'll never bet. hear the end of this. Trixie was a little slow reacting down at third base here. Tony Phillips slices it right down toward the coaching box, and I think it caught him on the hip as he tried to dodge out of the way. How about a record for Dick Trzuski? 22 years with the Detroit Tigers. To second base. Tony Phillips retired as Reynolds gets him out of there. There are two down here in the third inning with Lou Whitaker. Coming up.
want to remind you, ESPN's coverage of Major League Baseball on Friday at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. It'll be the Yankees and the Orioles. All-star apparent Wade Boggs and another all-star appearance for Cal Ripken. They'll go at it. That'll be followed by Mark Grace and Mike Piazza and the Cubs and Dodgers, 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. The doubleheader coming up on Friday night. Lou Whitaker's six-game hit streak still on the line here. He flied out the center his first time up. Two down, nobody on. Detroit leading 1-0. The other amazing thing about Dick Trzuski, I have to get in. This has got to be a record. He coached first base for 20 consecutive years. 20 years as the first base coach. He's now in his third season at third. I mean, that's unbelievable. The game's got to look backwards to him. <laughs> 20 years at first, now he's watching guys go the other way, coming at him instead of running the other way. That's unbelievable. That one misses inside. And 3-0 uh, count now on Whitaker. Gene Root now has the job over there at first base for the Detroit Tigers. Three-zero count, two down, nobody on, and four out of the strike zone. And Sutcliffe delivers the walk with two away. Fryman will be coming up. Let's check in with Tom. Hi, Gary. Big series at Skydog. Jays and the Yankees. The Jays coming in just a game out of first tonight. This is Devon White singling to right field. Darnell Coles rounding third and coming around to score. In the second, it's 2-0 Toronto. John Olerud on the night, 0 for 1. He tries to extend his hitting streak to 27. Well, as Peter said this morning, Buck Martina is the reason John Olerud is on that streak. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> he what showed you say he did? I just showed him a little thing with his hands in spring training. And <laughs> <laughs> this made a minor adjustment. <laughs> you know, actually, what happened to him in spring training was Molitor went up to him in spring training and said, when are you going to win a batting title? Hello. Pretty good endorsement from a 15-year veteran. And someone who can push him. <laughs> yeah, and will. <laughs> Travis Fryman had the double his first time up. He's now hit safely in four games. Two down, a runner at first. Tigers leading 1 0 here. And uh, Fryman, the one ball, one strike count. There you see the numbers he's putting up. Larry Herndon, the batting coach for the Tigers, believes that this is the finest young hitter he's seen come into the game with an idea of what he wants to do when he steps into the box. He's got a plan. And he also points out the fact that Fryman adjusts very well during the course of a ball game. So often nowadays, young hitters just make a plan at the start of the game and stick with it throughout the nine innings. He led shortstops and RBIs last season in the majors with 80, 14 home runs, tied him with Kel Ripken for home runs by a shortstop in the majors. So he's put up some magnificent numbers in a very young career yet. Good hitter on the road. For some reason, Tiger Stadium's not been favorite place for him. His career average is 243 at home and over 290 on the road and he's doing it again this year. You know what happens to hitters like Fryman a young hitter they get pool conscious when they see that short porch in left field and they pull off the ball so much. Took care of that problem right away. That one misses up high and the count goes to three balls and one strike. Two down. Lou Whitaker's on at first base and Sutcliffe working behind here. He has given up two walks. The one run on one hit. First walk he gave up to Tony Phillips is the run that's up there on the board. Full count. How many, you ask? It's typical numbers for Exceptional. Yeah, he'll be well over 100 if he gets into the sixth, seventh inning. He loses a lot of pitches anymore. Runner goes on the 3-2, and he's walked another. So back-to-back -back walks coming with two down here in the third inning as Travis Fryman goes down with a third free pass given up. Now two on, and you don't necessarily like to do this with Cecil Fielder coming up. Tells you what Sutcliffe thinks about Fryman's ability. A sidearm break and pitch, three and two. And he walks him, and now he's got to contend with Cecil Fielder. Fielder has gone one for eight in the times he has faced Sutcliffe. He's having a great month of June. 
Grounded out but picked up the RBI his league leading 61st on a ground ball out fouls that one off strike one. See what they're trying to do to Cecil early in this ball game pound him inside to make him make an adjustment so he can get to that ball. Sutcliffe is trying to get to the outside corner but he has to get Cecil off the plate. And this is how you do it with that good fastball off the plate about eight inches and he gets the foul ball strike. First and second occupied two down Sutcliffe down low one ball one strike Sutcliffe is trying to put the inside half of the plate on fielders mind to get him to make an adjustment and then he'll go away he's waiting for Cecil to show him that he's going to open up that front side. Cecil of course always like these swingers a strikeout potential for a pitcher. He's gone over 150 strikeouts now for yet another season three consecutive and uh, Cecil Fielder this season is already up to 56 in the strikeout department. Plenty of time to get over that 150 mark again. Well, he's got a little better ratio this year than he's had in the last three seasons. Off speed pitch tried to tantalize him. Missed up high with it. Two balls and two strikes. Cecil likes the warm weather. <laughs> He's got a chance to pick up some more right here. Whitaker on at second base. Travis Fryman on at first. Two down. Two two count. And Cecil. That big huge cut fouls it off. Did anybody really know Cecil Fielder had this inning before he went to play in Japan. I mean, I know one guy that worked for the Toronto Blue Jays who did. Yeah. A coach named John McLaren, now with Seattle. We used to hang out long before games, with it, late in the season in '87 when they were playing the Tigers, and he used to tell me, if Cecil ever gets his chance, he'll be a 40 home run hitter. Well, he was wrong. He's going to hit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> two two. And it's a full count. Sutcliffe with two on goes full to Cecil Fielder. You know, they had to make a decision. They had both McGriff and Fielder, and they didn't feel that they could utilize both of them. They basically did Fielder a favor when they allowed him to go to Japan. Kirk Gibson waiting on deck. This will be the 28th pitch of this inning by Rick Sutcliffe. Two on, two down. Tigers leading 1 0. Cecil Fielder waiting. Certainly wasn't much to indicate it unless you knew him. I mean, the numbers he put up in Toronto in 87, he had 14 home runs. He had nine and 88 limited action. These weren't full years. And then over to play in Japan where he hit the 38. And it's been 51, 44, and 35 home runs the last three years. That's a line drive caught perfectly positioned. Harold Reynolds. They had the second baseman moved over towards second base. That just saved at least one run and got them out of the inning. Send your advanced scouts out. Each team does ahead of the team to face to look at the ball club they'll face next. One reason defensive positioning. And it's really important to know what Rick Sutcliffe is trying to do. He has to execute the game plan but Harold Reynolds was played perfectly and that's what happens. You go over the scouting report and then you talk to the starting pitcher. He might have a different idea. So you have to make sure that everybody's on the same page when you line up defensively. Jack Voigt, the number nine hitter, gets his first at bat as we go to the bottom of the third. And he fouls off the delivery by Moore. See the numbers for Voigt. 0 for his last nine. Brady Anderson and the chicken pox. He's out, of course, on a day to day. And that's a real day to day. Voigt getting some playing opportunity now was that triple A Rochester hitting 361 there in three home runs 11 RBIs good start for him at triple A been used as a pinch hitter first left DH and right jumping in all over the place working in left field in this ball game Boyk waiting breaking ball by Moore misses outside two balls and one strike Mike Moore has a track record of being able to get a lot of ground balls like he's done tonight. I mentioned earlier that he had a blister problem on his pitching hand that didn't allow him to throw that fork ball very effectively. 
Throws some heat that time and not very happy with it. He wanted that at somewhere around the strike zone. Falls behind now. Three balls and one strike. Watch how he gets out in front here and throws the ball down and away from the hitter. And he talks to himself after that. It's just jumped at the plate instead of allowing his pitching motion to be smooth and deliberate. Well, the young man at the plate getting a start, batting ninth, 0 for 9. You're behind him. And even worse, you're walking. That'll really get you talking to yourself. First walk given up by Moore, leadoff man on here in the third inning. Let's take a look at this delivery by Mike Moore. He uses the split finger pitch an awful lot. This right there, down. Well, another chance here as Moore puts the leadoff man on. That is the second of three innings now. The Orioles have had the leadoff man on base. Devereaux let it off with a double and did not score in the last inning. Moving in at third base is Livingstone. Harold Reynolds grounded out his first time up. He can move a runner around. He's got a pretty big hole between first and second. As the bag will be held by Cecil Fielder and Whitaker. A little over towards second base here. So if he pulls it, he's got a shot at it. They want to check to see if he went after it. No, says Rich Garcia. Ball one. Five hits and 18 at bats in his career against Moore. He's checking down at third base. Mike Ferraro, the third base coach of the Baltimore Orioles. See whether or not they want him to lay one down here. Detroit leading it by a score of one nothing. Showing no bunt there. Two balls and no strikes. Harold Reynolds is so good with the bat. He can take a shot at that hole on the right side. He's trying to get a pitch on the inside part of the plate, inner half of the plate, that he can hook into that hole. Cecil Fielder's tied to the bag with a base runner on first. Reynolds leads the club with seven sacrifices, six of them while he's been batting left-handed. 235 right-handed, 268 from the left side. 2-0 count here. Reynolds. And three balls, no strikes is Moore. Way off the strike zone now in the first two batters. Looks like he may have lost a little in the motion. Lost that release point that we talk about so often. You can tell when a pitcher is adjusting to the release point because the pitches all of a sudden start being opposites. High, low, inside, outside. It's like sighting in a, for a shooter. They're trying to get that good shot chart going. That's what he's trying to do right now. Three and one. I think that's when a catcher really becomes valuable. When he recognizes what the, where the pattern's going and how to get it back into that little grouping you're talking about. 3-1 count. That was actually pretty close. They almost caught him leaning. Boyd over there with a 3-1 delivery was looking down at second base, and all of a sudden, Moore, not a hard toss, threw one over. He will be a little more attentive. Looks like he's got running on his mind, doesn't it? Oh, does, doesn't he? Looks like Moore's aware of it. Reynolds, very good hit and run guy. 18 games Boyd has played in has not tried to steal a base. Three balls, one strike. There he goes. Reynolds up high. And Moore's got himself into a jam to start the third inning as he's walked the first two batters. Mickey tells him going out there to talk to him had told Moore before the game just concentrate on throwing strikes. And he brought up a statistic that Tettleton had had pushed into his brain when he played for the A's. Dave Duncan used to keep stats on what hitters did on first pitch strikes. Said that they hit 157 when they put first pitch strikes in play. He brought that statistic up to, to Moore this afternoon and said, look, just throw the ball over the plate. If they only can hit 150 or 160 when you throw it over the plate, why are you getting behind guys? Age-old recommendation, isn't it? That sometimes seems to be so rarely followed. Mike McLemore had the single in the first inning. Two on, nobody out. Again, they play for the bunt at the corners. Livingstone and Cecil Fielder are both moving in. 
This is one of the toughest plays in the game for a third baseman. He has to make a very difficult quick decision. If the ball is bunted towards him, does he play the bunt and go to first to get the runner, or does he let the pitcher play the ball and he goes to third to try and get the lead runner? When a guy swings away, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> one ball, one strike. Incidentally, Mark McLemore wanted to pass on his regards to his parents, Elsie and Rebecca McLemore, who are both recovering from surgery back home in San Diego under the care of his aunt, Shirley, and he just wants to let them know he's thinking about them. Nice thought. One ball, one strike. There's the body. Tried to get down to third and pushed it foul. So McLemore now down on the count, a ball and two strikes. He has two sacrifices to his credit this year. Well, he's in between here is he never really got squared around. That ball went off the bat, went into foul ground. Sacrifice, you love to see those guys square all the way around, make the commitment, and make a solid bunt. Ideally, you want the bunt to go to the third baseman to move those base runners up. Voigt and Reynolds are the base runners. Voigt at second. Fouled it off. Shouldn't there be an automatic, what, with the money they earn today, about $5,000 fine when you don't get a bunt down? I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> As a former player rep, I think Mr. Martinez might. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm a broadcaster. I think you're right, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> One ball, two strikes here. Mike Moore has walked only two, but they're the first two in this inning. McLemore, one, two. Right center field. Pretty good wood. Deer and Gladden going back. Gladden reaching out. Can't get it. Bounced out of his glove. Late start at second base for Boyd, and he's going to hold up. It's going to be one of the longest singles you'll ever see. About 400 feet. A single that hopped off Gladden's glove. Boyd thought it was going to be caught. He stayed at second base to tag up. By the time he took off, Reynolds was already there with him. McLemore can't believe he ends up with a single and no RBI. Neither can Sparky Anderson. Jack Boyd has got the score on this play. There's no excuse for not scoring. You can go all the way to third base and still get back. You got to go halfway on that, and then you go back and tag up. But he has got to be able to score on that ball. McLemore jumps all over the pitch and drives it to right center. Gladden's got a beat on it, but just shies away from the wall right at the end, and it goes off the heel of his glove. Now look at the confusion. McLemore believes he's got a double, but he gets there, and hey, there's a base runner. Reynolds is at second. Base is loaded. Cal Ripken strike on the inside corner. The Detroit Tigers and Mike Moore have given the Orioles a chance in all three innings. None quite like this, however. Nobody out. Bases are loaded. A single for McLemore and two walks have set it up. And now Ripken with a big chance with Detroit leading it by a score of 1-0. Moore's back to the mound. Double play. Yes. No. He threw it by Tuttle and two runs scoring. Throw to Moore. Did not get him. Voigt and Reynolds both cross the plate. And Baltimore leads 2-1. chance for a one two three double play and got in a hurry and all Sparky Anderson can do is have a little smirk on his face take a look at it. this is exactly what Moore was hoping for but he throws it away mm -hmm. one runs in and then he stands out there and forgets to cover home good heads up base running by Reynolds beats the tag at the plate Dale Ford's all over it but Moore is just too late to make the tag you can't score on a 400-foot single. You do score on a 40-foot comebacker. Twice. Twice. <laughs> oh, Lordy. It's a fielder's choice, and, of course, the error charged to Mike Moore, 13th in the league of the Tigers in fielding. That time, though, it's the pitcher not helping himself. Over to third base on that went McLemore. 
Cal Ripken is on at first, and now Harold Baines, there's still nobody out. Infield will play for the double play. Baines, strike one. Well, Moore has really hurt himself in this inning, walking the first two, then creating the error on the bases loaded comebacker by Cal Ripken. Had him right where he wanted him. Well, he should step off the mound and regroup right now. If you can see, he's still talking to himself. Strange inning going on right here. A two to one lead now for Baltimore. Harold Baines way inside to him. One ball and one strike on Baines. Moore's first appearance against Baltimore this year. He beat them three times last year with a 2-1-0 ERA pitching for the Oakland A's. Lifetime he's 15 and 10 against them. You saw that notice out on the big scoreboard. Harold Baines towards short. Fryman to second. Whitaker to first. And they turn the double play. No RBI on it as McLemore scores from third. Three runs in in the inning. And the Baltimore Orioles now have a three to one lead. They've done it with one single. And they get the double play ball here. Fryman flips to Whitaker, who converts it to first base, but on the play, McLemore scores, and they cash in those three base runners in a situation that you would have expected the Tigers to be able to strand all three of them. So they're empty, and there are two down. And Mike Devereaux stands in. It's one thing to give the run with a with just a physical error, throwing the ball wild, but his not covering the plate resulted in two runs. And that's those are huge. There's another fine. Misses outside, two balls and no strikes. I grieve. <laughs> <laughs> Arbitration, I lose. Oh, that's one of the wackier lines you'll see. But then these two teams are playing those kind of games right now. 2-0 delivery. Detroit Tigers have got to be wondering. I mean, it's only the second year at Camden Yards, but I mean, last year couldn't win a ball game here, 7-0. They were up seven to one last night and lose 12 to nine. They're 0 and 8 here at Camden Yards. 2 1 delivery. I asked Lou Whitaker about that before the game. I said, What is it about this park you don't win? He says, Oh, we've won games here. I said, No, you haven't. He said, We haven't? He said, Well, we should have won that one last night. <laughs> <laughs> the old coulda, woulda, shoulda rule. More broken background ball to short. Travis Fryman's got it. Well, Moore gets the out, but three runs score, two walks, a single, one scored on the double play, and one on this error of Moore who didn't cover the plate. So hope you're enjoying it here as the Tigers and Orioles go at it in their second of a three-game series. Baltimore, they have won their last two in a row, but they've won their last seven here at home. Baltimore Orioles now in Camden Yards this season are 17 and 12. They were 43 and 38 at their new yard last year. Really struggled partway during the season in winning games at home and then picked it up. Kirk Gibson of the Detroit Tigers leads it off. It'll be Gibson, Tuttleton, and Deer coming up against Sutcliffe. Missing with that one, ball one. Gibson grounded out his first time up. Four for 18 lifetime now against Rick Sutcliffe. Tigers as a road team this season, 17 and 12. Deep and foul. 318 down the line. He'd straightened it out. It had been a goner. Gibson's been struggling at the plate. No struggle here. He just got out ahead of it a bit. What's the reaction? It's been that kind of frustrating time for Kurt Gibson. Just a few feet wide of the mark and then he tries to get on with a bunt. You know the Tigers were out here at three o'clock this afternoon taking extra batting practice and Kurt Gibson was really working hard trying to regain that stroke that he had at the start of the season in a bit of a hitting slump and hitters just like pitchers tend to force things got his body involved in it. Well early in the season he concentrated so much on going away hitting the ball the other way. Now they started pitching him in which is why he's hitting 141 over the last 28 games but he's been working on pulling the ball again. There is the first strikeout that we've had 
in this game. Sutcliffe gets it, one away in the fourth inning. Tom. Gary up at Skydome. Don Mattingly's had it tough with runners in scoring position, 225 on the year, but don't tell the Blue Jays that. Look at this gap at the right center. At the time, it was 2-0 Toronto, but this one scores two. Watch the Jays miss the cutoff man here. They might have had to play at third. As a result, they don't. Mattingly was safe. The game is now tied at three in the fourth. Gary? Another fine. Boy, we're piling them up here tonight. Missed the cutoff man. Here's Mickey Tettelin. They really do play him to pull. If he wants to bunt down the third baseline, it's all his. He flying out the center his first time up. They've shoved it way around here. Gomez, the third baseman, is playing where the shortstop would be. Ripken is behind second base. Reynolds, deep second. And Segui back at first. Mickey Tettelin takes Sutcliffe's delivery up high. One ball, one strike. Delton has a remarkable combination of a power hitter. He's very patient and he's very selective. Knows the strike zone very well. And he loves to get the pitcher in a hole. He'll take those borderline strikes and try to sit on something out over the plate. That's one of the more unusual get ready stances. You see how he lays the bat back. But as virtually every hitting instructor will tell you, it doesn't matter how you start. It's whether or not you develop a rhythm to get to the pitch. And all the hitter's hands will end up just about in the same spot when that front foot hits. 2-1 pitch to him. Tettelin rips it down the right field line. He was ready with that one. McLemore moving over to get it in the corner. Cuts it off. Good play. Good play. Tettelin held to a single by a sharp defensive play. Mark McLemore in right field. McLemore's taken every opportunity he's gotten in the outfield and made the most of it. Tettleton gets the ball out over in his strong suit, right out over in his zone. Look at McLemore get to the ball and cut it off before it gets to the wall. That keeps Mickey Tettleton at first base. This guy's got seven assists in the outfield. Tip of the cap to McLemore. Let's see how it affects this inning. Remember that. Tuttle and could be on second base, but for that play. One on, one down. Rob Deere popped out, takes the big cut, strike one. McLemore spent the winter in Arizona working with Mac Newton, the physical trainer, did a lot of work at, with Vince Coleman and some other people, and he strengthened himself. He's really changed his physique around quite a bit, and he's really been rather spectacular in the outfield for a guy who's been a second baseman his entire career. He's a real worker going to stay in this game and going to play whatever it takes to do that. Rob Deere, Ripken, Reynolds, Betcher. Rob Deere hits into the double play. That takes care of it. Only three face. The single. Nobody left on. Baltimore up. Three to one. Little dusk settling in here. Baltimore Orioles have the three to one lead. Three unearned runs in that third inning on one hit one error and nobody left on after Cecil Fielder drove in the first run on a ground ball out in the first inning. So Sutcliffe and Mike Moore locked up into one here with their typical kind of guys getting on base game. Chris Hoyles leads it off. Hoyles, Segui and Gomez will be up for Baltimore. Hoyles grounded out his first time up. Three runs, three hits, no errors for the Orioles. A run, two hits, and a very costly Mike Moore error for the Detroit Tigers. Moore has won his last two games. Trying to make it three in a row here. Deep to left field. Tony Phillips looking. Goodbye, home run. Chris Hoyles. right there twice last night from Hoyles and he gets a ball right in his zone just above belt high and he hammers it. No doubt about that one at all. A bullet just a couple of rows into the seats in left field. Chris Hoyles picking up his 12th home run. Segui grounds to Lou Whitaker. Hoyles is on an absolute tear now. That's his fourth home run in three games. Seven hits in his last 10 at-bats including those four homers 
And it is a four to one Baltimore lead. Detroit's almost got them right where they want them. Stage that big <laughs> comeback. There's their catcher, Chris Hoyles. Power. Taken down low by Gomez, who grounded out his first time up. Of course, as Tettleton moved over to Detroit, so Hoyles came over to the Orioles in the Fred Lynn deal from Detroit originally. That one hit high in the air to left field. Tony Phillips on the warning track. And Leo Gomez gave it a ride. And there are two down. ESPN's coverage of Major League Baseball this Sunday. The Kansas City Royals at Cleveland Indians. David Cohn will be on the mound, 5-7 and seven on the year. Albert Bell for the Indians, leading the American League with 20 home runs. Ian Baeg are putting up some big offensive numbers. David Cohn coming off a fine performance last night, which he picked up a win. Kansas City Royals have really turned their season around. Catching the ball, getting good defense. But Gagne and Lean have really turned that club around defensively up the middle. That'll always make your pitching staff better. Old adage that still holds true. Up the middle. Boyd inside to him. One and one. You know, this is the first time the Royals have had a ball club that can play better than the visitors in Royal Stadium in a number of years. Ray in center. When you were there in the 70s, that home field advantage was just amazing. None of the other American League teams could play defense in that park. That Amos Otis in center. Freddie Patek. Frank White up the middle. You. Great defensive catcher. There you go. <laughs> two, two balls, one strike, two down. 4-1, Baltimore leading. Another fly ball. It'll be played in center field by Gladden. Puts it away, but Hoyles had the home run. His 12th leading the inning off, and it's now 4-1, Baltimore. And we welcome you to the moonshot here, along with 46,288. 21st sellout out of 29 games played here at Camden Yards this season. What a beautiful night. And we go to the top half of the fifth inning. Rick Sutcliffe, Livingstone, Gladden, and uh, Tony Phillips do up for the Detroit Tigers. Who had the one to nothing lead. Baltimore's come back again. They now lead it four to one. Livingstone, he'll start it out with a base hit to right center field. Devereaux, will get it back in, so the leadoff man is on. And the Detroit Tigers just there. They're struggling for hits here. They had Fryman's double, the single by Tettleton. And now Livingstone picking up a single here in the fifth inning. And they've got the leadoff man on base. Ever familiar sight here at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. And that's the full house. Gladden flied out his first time up. Sutcliffe staying outside on him. Fouls it off. I think it's the attitudes of the Dan Gladdens and the Kurt Gibsons and the Cecil Fielders that's going to keep this Tiger Ball Club around the top of the American League East. These guys have a lot of pride. They play hard. They want to go out and win every night. I don't expect this team to really fade from the scene. You know, but you take Gladden as one example. They have, they have a lot of characters on this team. They like to say, you know, we're exactly the same as the Phillies. It's just that Sparky doesn't let us show it quite in the same way. But they've got just as many genuine characters. And then Gladden can be one of those when he so desires. Pitcher's taken away, and the count goes to two balls and one strike. In that regard, both of those ball clubs are kind of throwback teams. Sparky Anderson had a team like that in Cincinnati. They're a loose bunch of guys, had a lot of pride. Kurt Gibson plays hard. You don't have to ask him or you don't have to motivate him. Just send him out there. That was Sparky's adage. He said a baseball manager is a necessary evil. This is a simple game. If you have good players, keep them in the right frame of mind. You're a success as a manager. And right now he's getting that done. Great to have you with us. ESPN's Wednesday Night Baseball here at Camden Yards, home of the Baltimore Orioles. They've won seven in a row here, including their victory over the Tigers in game one of this series last night, 12-9, the final. They've got a four-to-one lead here down the right field line. McLemore in fair territory pulls it in. Livingstone goes back, and Gladden is retired. A couple of fly ball outs against Gladden now. So he said Sparky is trying to tie Walter Alston for fifth on the all-time list and wins. 
One more victory and he's got it. You see the man he's chasing though is Connie Mack. 53 years Connie Mack was involved as a manager in Major League Baseball. I mean that is absolutely unbelievable. The other unbelievable thing is he lost a lot more games than he won. <laughs> Enormous numbers against him in that department but still number one in wins. One down runner at first base. Tony Phillips takes the pitch. I guess if they call the manager Mr. Mack he has security. I think you're right. Yeah. He wears a tie and a three piece suit and owns the team. He's got even more security. Tony Phillips scored the only Detroit run in the first inning when he led the ball game off with a walk. One of three given up by Sutcliffe who has struck out one. Off the fists on that one to center field. Still got a lot of it but not on a good part of the bat. Devereaux hauls it in. Livingstone with a leadoff single is still there with two down. You know talking about managers the one thing that all of those managers have in common is their ability to communicate. They don't really have to motivate but Sparky recognizes he's got 25 different personalities. David Wells who came over from the Blue Jays needed to be talked to kind of rough. He likes that. He likes the challenge. And Sparky said you're a good pitcher and I know you're a good pitcher. Go out there and show me how good you are. That's exactly what Wells needed. And you know Sparky's changed with the times. I mean the players are all kidding about they actually are allowed to wear jeans on, on airplane rides now which is never of course allowed in the past. Matter of fact Sparky just walked up to Mike Henneman the other day and said do I have a rule about not wearing shorts to the park. Henneman said, yeah, and it's dumb. He said, all right, that rules out. <laughs> I was thinking that today, walking into the park and watching a couple of Orioles players walk in in shorts. Earl Weaver always insisted they have slacks and on the road suits and ties everywhere. It was changing times. The more money they make, the more sloppily they want to dress. <laughs> <laughs> That's the golden rule, I guess, huh? That's right. You got the gold, you make the rules. That's right. <laughs> One ball and one strike on Lou Whitaker who drew the walk his last time up and was left stranded. Whitaker batting at 323 fouls that one off outside of first base. One ball two strike count is Sutcliffe. Goes ahead on the count here with Scott Livingstone still on at first base. Well Sutcliffe has answered the questions about the eight days rest. Was I don't see anything different in Rick Sutcliffe than I would have seen if he'd pitched for four days. Right? No, not at all. He threw a simulated game on Friday. So if you take the right attitude out on the mound in a simulated game, you can really get a lot of beneficial work. But it's up to the individual. And Sutcliffe is at a point in his career where he understands what kind of work he has to put in to be effective. And insists that those around him be doing the same thing. You bet. In no uncertain terms. He's the recognized undisputed leader of this Baltimore team. Yeah a couple times last year he got their attention didn't he. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he likes to slam things around when things aren't going too well and he's real serious about it. Misses with a breaking ball inside that time to Whitaker two balls two strikes two down. Sutcliffe has not lost a game since April 27. He has had nine starts since then gone five and oh with four no decisions. He's three and one at home four and one on the road. That's one of the reasons why that decision as to whether or not he would take that five game suspension was important to him because he was pitching so well so successfully. He really didn't want to come out of the lineup then. Has a big hole at second base hit him where they ain't. Lou Whitaker's got a base hit. Livingstone makes his way to third. Harold Reynolds was playing him to pull the ball and instead he went up the middle with it. Two on two down. And Whitaker has hit safely now in seven games. We talked about the defensive alignment behind a veteran pitcher. Sutcliffe was playing Whitaker to pull. But he got a ball out over the plate, got too much of the outside part of the plate. Whitaker took it right back up the middle. If Reynolds is in his normal second base position, that's an easy play for him. But Sutcliffe wanted him overplayed toward the first base side of right the right side of the infield and Whitaker got a base hit. Credit him with a good at bat. And now with two on and two down Travis Fryman who has doubled and drawn a walk stands in with a chance to do some two out damage here against Rick Sutcliffe and the Orioles. 
Travis Fryman hitting 311 on the road coming into this game. Does not get the cut he wanted right there. 0 and 1. Well, that's what happens with a veteran pitcher. Third time around, Fryman had an idea what Sutcliffe was going to do, and Sutcliffe crossed him up. Oh, take the third, look to first. Hang on to the ball play. Clutch hitting is what it's called. Travis Fryman. Tremendous numbers. 0 1 delivery to him. One ball, one strike. Livingstone at third. Whitaker on at first base. Two singles here in the fifth inning. Each team now with four hits in the game. There's Livingstone. Let it off with a single. And Whitaker pushed that ball up the middle. Thought about it. Good pitch inside corner. Couldn't pull the trigger. One and two. Once again, Sutcliffe crossed up Fryman. Fryman hit a double in the first inning on a breaking ball outside. This time, Sutcliffe goes inside. You can see Fryman's really diving out over the plate, looking for something away from him. Sutcliffe hits the inside corner. One, two delivery. Two balls, two strikes. Last night when he hit his homer, he was looking in. It was a good pitch on the inside part of the plate. He got his hands, got the bat out there, and hit the home run. Another man with home run power waiting on deck. But for him to get up, Fryman's got to do something here. Two balls, two strikes. First and third occupied. And the fake again. When did that play last work? Steve Busby did it in about 76, yep. I think. 75, probably. And that was actually the only time. <laughs> Gerald Ford was still the president. The guy at third base <laughs> fell down. You know, Sutcliffe has picked off a runner at third. He picked Greg Vaughn off at third. 2-2 delivery. Oh, he got a breaking ball. He really had Fryman thinking on that one. Fryman was scared he'd come inside, so he dipped one away for a one ball. ESPN's presentation of Major League Baseball is brought to you by Fleer Ultra Baseball Cards. Fleer Ultra, you can't buy a better baseball card. And by Isuzu, makers of incredible four-wheel drives. And we are back at it as Mike Moore goes to work here. 4-1. Baltimore has got the lead. They have the home run. Chris Hoyles picking up his 12th against the Detroit Tiger team that leads the world in home runs and in runs scored. But right now it's the Baltimore Orioles who are getting it done. Laid off batter Harold Reynolds, McLemore, and Cal Ripken will follow. Reynolds scored in the third inning after drawing a walk. Two back-to-back -back walks by Moore, the only two he's given up in that inning, kicked it off, and then his error, three unearned runs, came in that third. Moore has not struck anyone out yet in this game. Opposition hitting 268. Buck and I were looking at the numbers. A bit ironic, both right-handers and left-handers coming into this game hitting 268. Second base, Whitaker ranging outfield. Nice flip. He knew he didn't have time to set himself. That's a major league play by Lou Whitaker. And it looks so easy, just kind of let it go right on by. He looked like a quarterback going down the line and flipping it to a halfback out of the backfield. On the move, throws a strike to Cecil Fielder. Sweet Lou still doing it. There was a time a year and a half or so ago, everybody said, oh, Lou's really slowed down. Doesn't have the range anymore. Doesn't look like it to me. Absolutely not. Mark McLemore, he also scored in the third inning. McLemore's gone two for two coming into this game. Three hits in his last 19 at-bats. He may be getting it turned around for them now. Had a pretty good job in his career against Mike Moore. 12 hits and 36 at-bats off Moore. That's one of the reasons Mark McLemore is in there. The switch hitter batting second in the lineup tonight. He had 53 starts last season. McLemore coming off the bench, getting his playing time and doing it again this year. Both these ball clubs move a lot of people around. They play a lot of people and play them in a lot of different positions. On the left field line, that'll be a souvenir foul ball. Sparky says one of the reasons he does it is because he wants his team completely fresh come September 1st. Tony La Russa always did that and they used to just bury people come September. The only problem is he ends up with some weird defensive alignments. 
another thing, when you look at that lineup, those first four or five guys are always in the same place offensively. It's just defensively they move around. I think another reason you have so many players that are versatile, like Tony Phillips, who was developed by Tony La Russa, is the fact that most clubs are trying to carry an extra pitcher or two. The quality of the pitching just isn't there, and there isn't that depth where you could once go with nine, maybe ten pitchers, but now you're looking for that versatile guy like Phillips that can play several different positions and become a regular in the lineup playing two or three different places. 2-2 Two -two delivery, and he turns it over and gets it. Good pitch. So Moore gets his first strikeout of the game. McLemore is gone, and there are two down here in the fifth inning with nobody on. Dave Duncan, the pitching coach with the athletics, has taught Moore and Dave Stewart how to work with the forkball so they get the ball moving down and away from left-handed hitters. They'll actually turn that ball over with the forkball grip and get that screwball-like movement. What do you call that pitch? It's just a fork ball that screwball fork ball goes down and away. <laughs> Actually, it took a while for both of them to really master that pitch, but it's so effective. Cal Ripken involved in the most important play in this game thus far in the third inning. The comebacker back to the mound of the bases loaded. Mike Moore went to the plate trying for the double play and threw it away. Two runs scored on it. There were no RBIs. There were no earned runs. He didn't go around, says Larry Young. One ball, one strike on Cal Ripken. All-star teams are going to be announced next Monday for the National League, next Tuesday for the American League. Cal Ripken leading all shortstops by a huge margin over Travis Bryant. Cal Ripken, <clears throat> when a player has earned the respect around baseball that Ripken has. It's not surprising that he wins, even if he's hitting 222. I, I think there's something to be said for what the guy has given to the game. And Travis Freiman said just that, didn't he? He certainly did. He has no problems with not, not being in first place. Here's the one-two delivery. Will Travis Freiman be in the All-Star team? I think he will be. I think the most interesting Tiger question whether it be in the All-Star team, and I asked Buck this, will David Wells get chosen by Cito Gaston? Without a doubt. Nine and one. Swung on and missed, struck him out. Uh, foul tip, take it back. Stay in there, don't walk away, Cal. <laughs> now, Cito Gaston recognizes the year that David Wells is having, and you can bet he'll take it. Let's take a look at this last pitch. A little bit of a split grip there. Movement down and away. Ripken just got a piece of it. 2-2 two -two delivery this time. And Cal takes that one outside. Three balls and two strikes. Another former Blue Jay that Gaston might take with him to the All-Star game would be Jimmy Key, who's also having a real strong year. And Cecil. 3-2 <laughs> delivery. Shallow left. Tony Phillips moving in, puts it away, and Mike Moore has a 1-2-3 inning here in the fifth, but Baltimore up 4-1. That one big error by the Detroit Tigers, Mike Moore the pitcher, allowing three of those four runs to be unearned. Hoyles with a home run, accounting for the other for Baltimore. That's what Rick Sutcliffe has got to face this inning. That's a lot of home runs, folks. Cecil Fielder leads it off as we go to the sixth inning here at Camden Yards. RBI and a ground ball out in the first inning to put him on top in the American League with 61 runs batted in. And then he lined out with two on in the third. A hard line drive to second base. Reynolds who had him played over towards the bag denied him what would have been an RBI base hit by good positioning. 271 on the year now for Cecil. He's going for the downs on that one. No play as he fouls it back. Sutcliffe might have got away with one right there. That looked like a slider that hung up around the letters. And Cecil is a great cripple hitter. Those pitches that aren't really thrown well. You can see that ball was right in his wheelhouse, and he jammed himself. He dove out over the plate and caught the ball on the label of the bat. Sutcliffe with the 2-1 delivery. And again, got that one up high, Cecil Fielder. Push the bat in his hands. He wanted both of those last two pitches. 
He hasn't been missing too many pitches in this month of June. Nine home runs so far. Let's see where Sutcliffe goes now. Down and away should be pretty good. The 2-2 delivery. Cecil down to third. Gomez. Sigui makes the play. And there's one away. Asking Cal Ripken about the Baltimore Orioles' success before the games tonight. Cal didn't have any trouble summing up the reasons for it. Pitching, pitching, and more pitching. Uh, our starting pitching has been fabulous. Our bullpen has just been tremendous. Uh, we've been able to score a few runs and win a few games, but the real uh, people that get the credit is our pitching staff. Starting pitching sets the tone for the ball game. They go out there and keep you in ball games, gives the offense a chance to crank it up. Sutcliffe has been a big part of that for the Orioles. And he's got the lead working in this one to Gibson. I do think they have just about the best bullpen in the league, but I still think they may need another starting pitcher before this thing's over. They've gotten away a lot with Jamie Moyer, Valenzuela, and Sutcliffe, but you know Toronto's going to go get a front line starter before the end of July. The Yankees are going to do so. Sparky is hoping the Tigers can come up with a couple of solid middle relievers. To me, I, I, I still believe the Orioles need that one more outstanding starter to go along with Mussina, presuming healthy, and Ben McDonald if he'll just gain some confidence in himself. And that Messina question we raised earlier, Peter, obviously now becomes even more important. I mean, if he's really hurt, and he's going to be out for any length of time, and nothing has happened yet. It's just that he's not right, but what it is, it's wrong. Either they don't know or they're not saying. Well, hopefully it's just something that he hasn't worked out yet after being buried by about 25 Mariners. But there's no question that, that when a guy that has that kind of life on his fastball normally up in the strike zone doesn't have it, and when hitters come and are talking to the middle infielders of the Orioles about, gee, his eyes are very different. He looks scared. Mike Messina, I think, came out of high school about the most confident pitcher, confident pitcher I've ever seen. Kurt Gibson out in front of that one just gets it off the end of the bat, fouls it back, a ball and two strikes. One out, nobody on. This veteran, Gibson, now in his 15th major league season, played just 16 games last year before he was unconditional release after those games by the Pittsburgh Pirates a 268 major league average Gibson feeling about as good as he's ever felt and back with the guy he loves playing for in the city and ballpark he loves to play in and he got him great off speed pitch off speed breaking ball by Sutcliffe who now has struck out three and as is typical for Sutcliffe as the game goes along he gets tougher if you don't have the velocity to overpower hitters, you have to disrupt their timing, and that's what he does with this slow curveball. You can see how far out in front Gibson was. And Sutcliffe has retired the first two here in the sixth inning. Kurt Gibson, that's the 48th time he has struck out. Just under 200 at-bats for him now. Sutcliffe has walked three and struck out three. Mickey Tettelin had a single his last time up to extend his hit streak now to seven games. Tettelin was tied with Cecil Fielder for the RBI lead and Albert Bell. Seventh in slugging, ninth in walks. He's had two hits in 11 at bats against Rick Sutcliffe in his career, including the one he's picked up tonight. The other hit was a home run. Check swing ground ball to short. Ripken got a hurry, but. Settling with no great speed is out of there in a 1-2-3 inning for Sutcliffe, who protects the Baltimore Oriole three-run lead. Baltimore Orioles trying to make some ground up in the Eastern Division race. They trailed the Detroit Tigers by seven. They've got these three games against Detroit, then New York, then Chicago, and all those as part of this nine-game stand at home. And 20 of their next 27 are at home, so... As Peter mentioned at the top for the Baltimore Orioles. This is a real chance to, to really gain some ground here. And it's a tough time for the Tigers who are playing 20 out of 24 on the road. And Baltimore is getting it done again here having one last night. Harold Baines leads it off. It'll be Baines, Devereaux, and Hoyles. Baines, the designated hitter, batting clean up 0 for 2 and is grounded into a double play. One of the significant things about trying to get closer is Club President Larry Lachino said last night, they're not going to make a move for a big salary player until they know they have a real shot to win. Now, that doesn't mean three games, four games, five games, but you've got to be closer than seven or eight with three teams in front of you. This homestand should, should really tell that. I mean, during these nine games, 
they pick up a couple more games three certainly I would think then they're ready to, to really seriously look to make whatever move they think they've got to make Baines to right field looks like he got a little under maybe warning track room Rob Dewey. one away it is a pennant race Sparky who doesn't like to talk about pennant races said before tonight's game yep we got one and he's right in the American League Eastern Division. You look at the balance of the division, and basically all four of these teams have one missing ingredient. They have a problem, a weakness that they'd like to address. Detroit has concern about the middle bullpen. Henneman and Bob McDonald, the closers, the short men, are fine. The starters are good. Baltimore, they need maybe a little more pop. Somebody from the left side. Toronto still uncertain about their rotation. I'd like to see them have a couple of good turns through the rotation. And the Yankees. The Yankees need Jim Abbott to be Jim Abbott. I like the Yankees chances. Yeah they've got a good veteran ball club. You know, they add Boggs to that team. He's hitting over 225 or 325 now. Spike Owen. Although he doesn't have great range at shortstop any longer, making all the routine plays. Dale Ford calls the strike. Mike Moore was not happy with what he thought was a check swing on Devereaux on the pitch before that last one. He thought Devereaux had gone around. He took a little extra time to make the point. 2 1 delivery. Devereaux out in front of that pops it up to short. Fryman will be called off. Tony Phillips, that's his ball with the outfielder coming in. Devereaux is retired, two down. Chris Hoyle's coming up. I want to remind you, ESPN's All-Star Monday. What a day it will be. Monday, July 12th, the Home Run Derby, 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific. Then the Heroes of Baseball. That baseball game will be at 10 o'clock. And here's one of the guys who maybe is going to get a shot at it. Hoyles, who delivered his 12th home run, leading off the fourth inning in this game against Mike Moore, the 15th home run given up by Moore. In that home run derby, which will be right here in Baltimore, where the All-Star game is going to be played, each league will have four batters. Each batter gets 10 outs. They can hit as many home runs as they can get. They'll be working against batting pitcher pitchers. That'll be great fun. It'll be Miller and Morgan doing that one. And a lot of us will be involved in the Heroes game, which will follow that home run derby. You know, that should be quite a show here in this ballpark. In the afternoon, hot, and the ball will be flying out of this park. These National Leaguers will love the big shots at that right field short porch. Fouled off. <clears throat> Not to mention the alley in left center field. The Orioles pitchers keep telling me, you know, they've mislabeled that. It's actually 350, not 364, but they didn't dare put 350 up in a power <laughs> alley. Now, those are pitchers talking, so we have to understand that. There's that mark right there in the alley in left center field. You see how low that fence is. One of the reasons they kept those walls so low is to give outfielders a chance to pull balls back into the yard to make great defensive plays. The umpires complained about that last year because they said it was so difficult to call fan interference on those plays because guys were going up over, fans were reaching, players were grabbing. Yeah, uh, that's. But <clears throat> jumping over the fence is a slam dunk of baseball. I mean, I'm sorry for the umpires. It's great entertainment. Three nothing on that boat. Foul back <laughs> upstairs. <laughs> we, we just resolved that. Too, sorry, Rich Garcia, but. <laughs> <laughs> Orioles leading here four to one. Sure, put the names up now. <laughs> so all of umpiring will be after us. Two balls, two strikes, and two down. And Hoyles waiting on Mike Moore's delivery. And it's a full count inside three and two. Cal Ripken was one who dominated the home run derby two years ago in Toronto. Cal, of course, this being his home yard, may get a shot at it, I would think, again, is one of those four. Last year, here. it was Mark McGuire put on a tremendous exhibition. You know, in that all-star game in Toronto, when Ripken got so hot, Cecil Fielder was involved in that one, too, and he was having a tough time hitting the ball out of the park. Ozzie Guillen says, give me a bat. I'll go up there and hit a home run. And then Cecil hit one on the screws, and it went into the bar above the restaurant. And as soon as he hit it, they screamed in the dugout. He hit it in the soup. <laughs> it was one of the longest ones ever hit at Skydome. 
It's one of the few places where you really can get a fly in your suit. <laughs> Popped up to center field. Look out! It is an out. Whitaker is all right. So is Travis Fryman. Whitaker pulled it in. Fryman went down underneath him. And just a little fun with the boys out there in shallow center. Tom, thanks very much. Right now, the Baltimore Orioles trying to take the first two games of this series, leading here by a score of four to one, and we're going to the seventh inning. It's ended up being a real good pitcher's duel. One very costly error by Mike Moore is the difference in this game. Three unearned runs in the third inning. Chris Hoyles had the home run in the fourth inning for Baltimore. Detroit got a run in the first and a ground ball out by Cecil Fielder, who got the RBI scoring Tony Phillips, and that has been it. They have stranded. The Tigers have left five on three in scoring position. Baltimore has stranded a couple. The first two innings, they haven't left anybody on in the last four as Mike Moore has settled in. So he and Sutcliffe really going at it right now. Rob Deere fouling that off to even the count up. Deere, Livingstone, and Gladden, bottom third of the order. Sutcliffe, three walks, three strikeouts. Trying to continue the streak he is on, not having lost in his last nine starts. It's got pretty reasonable into the seventh inning. Remember, this is eight days rest for Sutcliffe. Most he's thrown this season, 128 pitches. That's his high. He's gone 14 out of 25 first pitches by Sutcliffe have been strikes. So not bad, really, for Sutcliffe. All those numbers are pretty decent night. He tends to be more on the negative side of those things in most games. The majority of those first pitch strikes came after he got the lead. Yeah. That'll help. One two right off the fist. He's really nailing these power hitters. Sutcliffe directing traffic. Make sure that Gomez gets it. Deer retired one away in the seventh. Tom. Gary Budweiser takes us north of the border to the Sky Dome. John Olrud trying to extend his hitting streak to 27. He's already 0 for 2. This against former teammate Jimmy Key. Ground ball to second. He probably has one more at bat to go. He's over three in the night. You know, Sunday night, Peter Gammon said the streak would end against Key tonight. Peter, you know something that we don't? Just an educated guess. Not that I said it would end. I just thought that Jimmy Key would be as tough as he'd have to face. Yeah, because he changes speed so effectively, moves the ball around. Knows him so well. It's a good call, Peter. That's why you're here. I hope he gets a hit last time. I want to see the tension of getting up there towards the DiMaggio. Scott Livingstone, one down, nobody on. He singled his last time up, was left stranded at third base. One away and nobody on here in the top half of the seventh. Livingstone, a real good hitter, left-handed. Thank you very much. He's now two for three in the game. That's a one-out single here in the seventh. His average... Overall, Major League batting average now is up around the 290 mark. We really like this guy. This is a solid, everyday, hard-nosed player. Just a matter of time before he takes over the everyday chores at third base. Right now, he's doing some platoon work with Alan Trammell, but he's a good hitter. And I think Sparky Anderson knows that sooner or later, he can go ahead and match him up against those left-handers, and he'll have the confidence of hitting very well. One down, one on, and Dan Gladden, who has flied out twice, once to right, once to center. He will step out here, waiting for Livingstone to get set over there at first base. And for the first time tonight, Baltimore will get a couple of guys up. Williamson and Pennington, closest to you. Ground ball, diving, Ripken off his glove, and the runners will stay first and second. Boy, Ripken almost twisted his ankle right there. See that big piece of turf that came up on him? Almost turned his ankle. That should be, I believe, a base hit. And uh, two on with one out. A single for Gladden, who's now hit safely in five. And the Tigers here in the seventh have it going. Gladden hits the ground ball right by the mound, and Ripken can't knock it down. He gets a piece of it, goes off his glove, but he gets to his feet quickly and keeps Livingstone at second base. There's another shot up. You can see he just barely tipped it. It slowed it down enough to keep Livingstone at second base. That's something you don't see too often. Cal Ripken now, diving for balls. <clears throat> That's a Baltimore tradition since Mark Belanger claims he never go for a ball here. Well, 
Well, they'll discuss it here. Sutcliffe, as we said, getting up on that 100 pitch count. Dick Bosman, the pitching coach, has come out to have a word with Sutcliffe and Hoyles now. Home plate umpire Dale Ford on the way up. Two on, one out. And Tony Phillips, top of the order, is coming to the plate. Buying some time for the bullpen. They should have enough time now to be close. And Dick Bosman either took as long as he could until Dale Ford, don't bite umpire, came out and broke up the meeting. Best bullpen in the major leagues right now belongs to the Baltimore Orioles. Even though they had to go to it here last night, Messina coming out after an inning plus. But you see their 2.50. Johnny Oates set a little more quietly on the bench than he might otherwise when he's got those guys to go to. Now let's see what goes here. Tony Phillips 0 for 2 in a walk and the only run scored for the Tigers. Always a threat to lay the ball down so Gomez at third has moved in a couple of steps on the grass. Even though there's one out here Phillips is bunting obviously he'd be bunting for the base hit. Six hits for the Tigers four for the Orioles. There you see Livingstone uh, Gomez rather moving in at third. Ripken went behind the bag, but no throw made by Sutcliffe. Livingstone on at second, Gladden on at first. With these Tigers, as every ball club knows, and as we've all learned last year and especially start of this year, it is never over. Yogi was absolutely right when Detroit's in the game. Sutcliffe missing inside, two balls, no strikes. What you're saying is you wish they had interleague play and they could play Colorado three games out there. How many home runs would Detroit have in a year if they if that was their home ball? 350. You saw a couple of those balls like the one Kevin Mitchell got jammed on in the ninth inning last night. It looked like a pop up the shortstop. Next thing you look up gone. Just amazing. Swung on and popped up shallow center field. Devereaux the late break moving in Jack Voigt. Voigt the left fielder takes it. Almost a little confusion on that one too. It looked like nobody was making the call on it. Tony Phillips retired. That's a big out for Sutcliffe, and there are two down. The Tigers had a problem with a pop up to center field. Look at the reaction from Phillips there. Not a pitch he thought he should hit. That ball rattled around in Voigt's glove in left field. Well, the Tigers have one of the people up there they want in flex situations. Phillips, one of those, did not get it done. And now Lou Whitaker, who has hit safely in the last seven by delivering a single in the fifth, comes up. Lou Whitaker takes an awful lot of first pitch strikes, except when he's got a chance to make a difference in the ball game, like now. He'll be looking for that first pitch fastball. Sutcliffe way inside on him. Sutcliffe knew that. He was going to give him nothing close to the strike zone. Now there are two down. Sutcliffe trying to get out of the inning after the one out singles by Livingstone and Gladden. They remain on at first and second. Lou Whitaker with a 326 batting average trying to get his team a little closer down by three. Whitaker 322 with runners in scoring position including four home runs in those situations. Ground ball to second base. Reynolds over. And Sutcliffe gets it done. Two more left on from Camden Yards at 7th inning. Great game here at Camden Yards. Welcome back, everybody. Gary Thorne, Buck Martinez, and uh, Peter Gammons with us here. Buck, pitching duel, just what we thought. Yeah, right. After <laughs> last night, we thought there'd be all kinds of home runs with Moore and uh, Sutcliffe on the mound, but they've been outstanding. Peter, this uh, Baltimore ball club, after last night, you really do build on a great comeback win like that. I think you really do, and I think it, the difference between being 9 out and being 7 out is tremendous for them right now. Well, Baltimore's got a chance to take two here against the Detroit Tigers in this three-game set. We go to the bottom half of the seventh inning, but as we said, the Tigers with all that power. And a lot of it coming up here for the middle of the order. Uh, for Baltimore, it's David Segui, and he's going to lead it off with a base hit to right. Segui on with his first hit of the night, so he's one for three. Baltimore would love to add some on to that lead. They get the leadoff man on against Moore. That is hit number five for the Baltimore Orioles in their first hit since Hoyles had the leadoff home run in the fourth inning. 
Segui on and Gomez coming up. Mike Moore has walked two and struck out one. Ford Gomez tonight a fly ball out and a 6 3 put out. Only two have been left on by Baltimore one in the first one in the second. And the strike taken. Detroit in first place leading by one Baltimore seven games back. Five and two mark and wins in his last two starts, but down here. And that one's going to be fouled off. When Leo Gomez first came into the league, the natural tendency for major league pitchers to test rookie ball players is to go to the breaking ball. And that was right up Gomez's alley. He was a breaking ball hitter coming into the big leagues. Now the pitchers have figured this out and they're really giving him a pretty steady diet of fastballs and he hasn't made the adjustment yet where he can really pound that inside fastball. I think a much that's the really the unusual adjustment. Usually the adjustment has to be made the other way around. I would think it would be a lot easier for him to learn to hit the fastball. If he can already hit the breaking ball. I think that's a plus for him. It is until you run up against guys like Moore who can locate that fastball inside and you can't get that bat head out. One ball, two strike count. Runner at first base and nobody out. Moore to Gomez. Off the end of the bat. Fouls it on for him in the front row. Ball girl will get that one down the line and one and two on Gomez. The Baltimore Orioles, they come into this game 12th in average and 11th in runs in the league. Their offense has struggled, 8th in on base percentage and 12th in slugging. So they are hoping during this homestand that they can get the offense going to match their pitching, which has the second best ERA and has given up the fewest runs in the league. That's why Cal Ripken was saying earlier pitching, pitching, pitching. That's why we've been successful so far. But our offense has got to join in this thing. And Ripken's one of those who would dearly love to be part of that. Struggling around the 220 mark right now. Two balls, two strikes. Got him. Gomez, not going to argue that one. Just tip your hat to Mike Moore, his second strikeout. That's what you were talking about, Buck, right where he wanted it. Take a look at Mickey Tettleton set up on the outside corner. And he freezes Gomez. He had Leo Gomez thinking about the inside fastball. Moore goes for the slider and gets the strikeout. Doesn't get many, but gets a big one right there on Gomez. Gomez takes the seat. One away. Segui remains on at first base. And Jack Voigt, who drew a leadoff walk in the third that started that inning where they had the three honor and run stands in now. Twenty two average for him straight away in the infield and the outfield on the right handed hitter off speed misses high and inside Moore is just having trouble getting the ball in on Voight for some reason the number nine hitter who desperately didn't want to put on and it cost him dearly there's the line for Moore in this game and a pretty solid outing for Mike Moore save that fielding miscue that Really cost him. On a comeback into the mound with the bases loaded, he made the wild throw to home plate. That allowed one run to score, but his failure to cover home plate cost him another. The biggest play in the game. Otherwise, this game would probably be tied. Voigt, way out in front of it, pulls it off the end of the bat to left field. Tony Phillips. Two down. Segui goes back to the bag. Well, the Pro Athletes Golf League inaugural event is coming up here on ESPN. It's the Michelob Invitational on Tuesday at 7.30 Eastern and 4.30 Pacific. This league consists of some top athletes who maintain a 10 handicap or less. They've got eight two-man teams competing. The likes of Jim Brown, Walter Payton, Stan Makita, Jim Rice, Grant Fuhr, Rick Barry. They are among some of the pro athletes involved in this golf league. It's their inaugural event coming up on Tuesday at 7.30 Eastern. 
4.30 Pacific. Two down. And the check swing foul ball by Harold Reynolds. I don't think I would quite qualify for that league. Uh, Not quite there Not yet. quite, no. See, you work too much. I could take the scores of two <laughs> of the guys, and if they'd let me do that, then I could qualify. <laughs> oh, one count, two down. Reynolds scored in the third after he'd walked. 255 on the year for Harold. Parting was partly sweet sorrow and partly it's time to move on to the Seattle Mariners. They had expected Brent Boone to be the everyday player at second base and phasing out Harold Reynolds. It's since been Rich Amaral who's taken over every day. Foul ball. And Rich Amaral is a great story. 31 year old minor league veteran. Right now he's got a great shot to be rookie of the year. It's one of those great cases. You, you know, we've seen them for years. These guys have put up great numbers. He's hit over 300, I think, five times, stolen 50 bases or more, three times in AAA. Never got the chance. He finally got it. Has he ever produced? Harold Reynolds left the Mariners 11 games shy of their all time record for games played, held by Alvin Davis. 1,155 games in the same uniform. Those kind of numbers aren't going to happen much anymore in Major League Baseball or any other sport for that matter. It's a come and get it with a big contract and move on to the next big contract kind of life now. 2 2 delivery with two down, down the left field line, and will end up foul ball on playable. One hop into the seats out of the reach of Tony Phillips. You know, speaking of the Mariners and Harold Reynolds' association with that ball club, I think that's the team that's going to play their way back into the pennant race. They're only three back now, but on the strength of their pitching staff, and we talk about pitching and defense and how important it is, they're led by Randy Johnson. Eric Hansen's having a fine season. We've got Dave Fleming back now, and as soon as Basio returns to the rotation, they should be very deep and strong in that starting staff. 2-2. They were playing shallow. Tony Phillips perfectly positioned. Moves over and makes it. That'll do it. Segui started it out with a single, but he is left stranded. We've completed seven. You'll see the big guy coming up when we come back. In this magnificent night, we go to the eighth inning. Rick Sutcliffe, Mike Moore locked up in a good one. Sutcliffe ready to go. And it's taken up high by Travis Fryman. Now, this is a big inning for Sutcliffe. He's got three, four, and five. Fryman, Cecil Fielder, and Kirk Gibson do up here. Fryman has already delivered that double that came in the first inning. Has hit safely in the last four. Sutcliffe has struck out three and walked three in this game. And has pitched very well. He's moving it around, keeping it where he wants it to be. He can get one more inning done here. He probably would come out. And they'd be in the save situation and try and put it away. Right center field, high in the air, but not deep. Right fielder Mark McLemore puts it away, and Travis Fryman is out of there, one down in the eighth inning. It's a very nice ball game. And you know, he really paced himself early in the ball game. We pointed out that he was just spotting the ball out of the strike zone trying to make perfect pitches early once he got the lead he went right down Broadway got ahead with the fastball there you see Williamson and Bennington have been up and throwing now for the last inning and a half they're ready if needed Sutcliffe has allowed only two leadoff batters on in the eight innings worked here that always helps inside corner strike to Cecil Fielder 0 for 3 RBI lined out with a couple on in the third inning Seven left on by the Tigers now. Four of those in scoring position. Tigers have had a home run in the last nine games. Sutcliffe, who has given up 14 this year, has not given up anything here tonight in that way. 86 home runs for the Tigers leading the majors. They're on a pace now to hit 204 home runs. They had 182 last year for Detroit. They'll be around that 200 mark again. One. Sutcliffe really has him guessing an off stride. All night long, Cecil Fielder has been on the wrong pitch. 
right here watch his reaction he's looking for fastball and he's out in front weights already on that front leg Sutcliffe comes with an off-speed curveball that one to short Ripken and Sassel's all for four as it's turned out, Johnny Oates didn't need to have Pennington here for Gibson, but no, just notice the way he had him ready. If anything happened with Fryman or with Gibson, or if the last inning had been extended, he had this kid who happens to be one of the great young left-handed arms in the game, ready to pitch to Gibson and turn Tevelin around. Bullpen, as we said, they've been up for a full inning. They're just waiting around. Gomez coming in, checking on how Gibson will be pitched to here. Gibson has struck out twice both times swinging and has grounded out. So Gomez is going to play in at third base on Gibson while everybody else moves back in the infield and outfield. Gibson takes the strike. Tigers need base runners here. Baltimore recognizes that. Gibson will do whatever's necessary, which means if you move way back in the infield and he thought he could lay one down and get on, he'd do it without a second thought. Sutcliffe gets ahead on the count again. Sutcliffe's only had one three ball count since the third inning. So as Buck mentioned, once they got the lead in this game, Sutcliffe started coming with those strikes on the first pitch. Well, that's what those old veteran pitchers will do. They'll get that win. They smell the W and they go right at you. They go for the juggler once they, once they have the lead. They know how to finish games off. Gibson waiting with a 1-1 to center field. It's deep, but there's a lot of room as you see that 410 mark. Devereaux hauls it in, and Sutcliffe is rocking along right now as he retires the side in order. Bottom of the eighth inning coming up. Oh, up. ESPN's Wednesday night baseball. They're delighted to have you with us here at Camden Yards with the Baltimore Orioles. They're trying to win yet another one. It would be their third in a row. And here at home, their eighth in a row. If they can hang on to the lead. We're in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Mark McLemore leading it off a single and scored in the third. Cal Ripken and Baines are due up. Pumping his average up here tonight. Mike Moore, his job now and he's got in the distance. Get these guys out, not give them any more and give the Tigers a chance here to come through in the ninth inning. Moore's retired 12 of the last 13 that he's faced in this game, but his own worst enemy tonight on a big error in the third inning and he had a chance with the bases loaded and nobody out to get a double play on a comebacker by Cal Ripken and threw it away and two runs scored on it. This is down low on that one and it's three balls and no strikes. There's the savior closer. Greg Olson. Just laid that one in. Three and one. That air by Moore was the first air in 32 chances for him. So he'll be thinking about that all night long. Hoyles, the home run in the fourth, the only other run for Baltimore. And he's on. Lead off walks. He let off that third inning with a walk. And it cost him dearly. He's given up three in the game now. McLemore is on. And that'll bring up Cal Ripken. Cal has had the 0 for 2 in the fielder's choice. He was involved in that third inning play on the comebacker that ended up being thrown away on the air. Against Moore, lifetime now, batting only 211 against Mike Moore in his career with a lot of at bats against him. Takes the strike on the inside corner. Well, we haven't mentioned it, but of course. 1,805 consecutive games, all starts, 326 games shy of breaking Lou Gehrig's record. I'm not sure he wants to hear about that anymore. No, there was a time when everybody poured into it, particularly two years ago, and he really heard a lot about it, saying he's tired and everything. Then he responded with that big 34 home run season, hit over 300, and he said, well, streak's not a problem. Now that talk is starting to creep back into Cal Ripken's life again.
Look at the concentration in those eyes. He got the breaking ball, stayed right on it, and he knows it's gone. Get out of here, ball. Eight home runs and 36 RBIs now for Cal Ripken, a two-run homer. McLemore came in ahead of him on the walk, and the Baltimore Orioles now have a 6-1 to one lead over the Detroit Tigers as Cal Ripken struggling at the plate. No question about that one off Moore, who has now given up 16 home runs on the season, including two in this game, Hoyles and Ripken. Harold Baines takes the strike. Well, Baltimore has reversed the tables on the home run hitting Detroit Tigers here tonight. Baltimore now with 54 home runs hit by them. Major League leading 86 for Detroit, but none of those have been here tonight off Rick Sutton. This is a significant homestand, as Peter mentioned earlier. They put together that win streak, but it came against Oakland, Seattle, and Boston. And now they're starting to play the clubs over 500. And the clubs in front of them. Cecil Fielder makes the flip, and that'll retire Baines. The home run by Cal Ripken, and a chance to see some more of this man at short and at plate. Friday at 7.30 Eastern and 4.30 Pacific, one of those teams they're chasing, the New York Yankees. Take on the Baltimore Orioles. Wade Boggs leading in the All-Star balloting at third base. And that will be followed by the Cubs and Dodgers. Mark Grace on it for the Cubs and Piazza. A great rookie season behind the plate. He's already bleeding. Dodger Blue. Doubleheader Friday night right here in ESPN. Baines the first out here in the eighth inning. One away and nobody on. Devereaux up. Gary, the pitching matchup in that first game, the Yankees and the Orioles, will feature Jim Abbott just returning from the disabled list. And Fernando Valenzuela, I believe. For a real classy left hander. Valenzuela is really throwing the ball well. It's a little different than he used to be. He's not throwing as many screw balls. He uses that cutter extremely. He pitches in very well to right handed hitters now. Check swing fouled off. Fernando's 2 and 7 with a 4 2 8. 73 innings, 66 hits. The opposition 244 against him. It's respectable for a pitcher. Very respectable. And they're not scoring many runs for him. Only David Cohn is getting. Less run support than Fernando Valenzuela. In the Mexican League, back to the majors. Oh, wow, was he fooled on that one. Whatever he was looking for, that wasn't it. A little weak wave on that one. And Moore gets the strikeout, and there are two down here in the eighth inning. Mike Devereaux is looking for a different pitch than the one he got from Mike Moore, for sure. He waves at this pitch. You can see just trying to make some kind of contact stay alive three strikeouts now for Moore and Hoyles who had his 12th home run in the fourth inning steps in so Moore did not get done what he wanted here and that was hold the lead to th that the Baltimore team had the three it's now a 6 1 lead and in the ninth inning if you're looking ahead Tettle and Deer and Livingstone will be due up that one to center field So Hoyles is on again as Gladden could not get there. Hoyles now a two for four ball game and a huge series underway for him against these Detroit Tigers with a six RBI night last night. Sparky Anderson has seen enough I believe. Mike Henneman had been warming up in the bullpen for Detroit. Mike Moore is going to come out of the game as he has given up six runs on seven hits and Moore is out of there with Baltimore leading it by a score of 6 1 coming in from the bullpen it'll be two down and one on we want to welcome everyone around the nation to a terrific spot here in Toronto Dave Sims and Larry Sorensen John Olrood 0 for 3 trying to keep the hitting streak alive bouncer up the middle spike on steps on second throws double play and that'll do it. Steve Howe, unlike last night, comes in and gets the job done. The Yankees stop the Blue Jays here in the eighth. Nothing so not only is Olrood's hitting streak probably over now at 26 games, unless the Blue Jays have an incredible rally in the ninth, the Yankees look like they're in good shape to win this game. We'll keep you updated. Let's go back now to Camden Yards and Gary Thorne. Gary? 
All right, Tom, thanks very much. New York Yankees, of course, very much in that mix. We were talking about the race. You're looking at Mike Henneman, who comes on in relief. Henneman last pitch Sunday. This will be his 32nd game of the season. 12 saves and 15 opportunities. Marty Anderson wants to make sure Henneman doesn't gather any rust down in the bullpen, so he's brought him on here in the eighth. And he faces Segui with a runner on at first base. Hoyles had the single that knocked Mike Moore out of the ball game. Moore seven and two thirds charged thus far with the six Oriole runs on seven hits. Walked three, struck out three, and gave up two home runs. Three unearned runs, but it was his error that resulted in the runs being unearned. Segui missing that one. One ball, one strike, two away. We're in the bottom half of the eighth inning as the Baltimore Orioles have the six to one lead. Adding two more here on Cal Ripken's eighth home run of the season. Well, Ripken, the first, fifth rather, home run that he has had in his career off Mike Moore. And he can relax and smile a little bit with the club up, and he played a big role in it. Two balls, one strike. I think it's important to see him smiling, especially here. I think it's been very hard. There have been some revelations about his contract and how he travels on the road and things like that. If you listen to the talk shows in Baltimore, you think this man is absolutely evil rather than this tremendous community figure that he's been. Memory span is mighty short in sports, isn't it? We saw a good example of what he does with his community before the ball game. He had a clinic with a bunch of kids, about 300 kids and parents. He was addressing them, fielding their questions right before batting practice. It was funny. One kid said, Cal, why'd you change your stance? He said, because the other one wasn't working. As honest an answer as you'll get it. Henneman starts his relief appearance with a walk. So Segui is on with two down. Runners now on at first and second. With two down. Sutcliffe waiting. Has not had a complete game this season with a seven and two mark with a six to one lead. He's going to probably get a shot at it here in the ninth inning. Especially since those two runs were added. In fact, it may make the difference to him coming back out and him not coming back out. Gomez struck out his last time up. He's 0 for 3. Leo Gomez. Henneman missing outside with that one. Boyles at second. Segui on at first base. Baltimore winners of 15 of their last 18 making the charge against Detroit. Fouled off down the right field line. No chance on that one. And a two strike count on Gomez. Baltimore with the best record in the major leagues here this month, 15 and 4. Chance to add to that. I mean, they are really on a tear right now. We'd love to have that happen, especially when you're at home to generate all that adrenaline flow. Big rock and cut on that one. Couldn't get to it, and he's gone. But two are added on the home run by Cal Ripken. Detroit's first air of the year came at the worst possible time for Mike Moore. So Rick Sutcliffe, a chance for the complete game win now, three outs away from it. Tettleton did go around. Rich Garcia at third base helping out behind the plate. Dale Ford, Tettleton, Deer, and Livingstone coming up. Mickey Tettleton didn't think he swung a death pitch. Watch his reaction. Now he's giving it to Dale Ford. He said, what'd you ask for that appeal for? You can see I didn't swing. See, catchers and umpires have this special relationship. <laughs> There's also a thing called the rule, and now Ford's about had enough. He's telling Tettleton, knock it off. The rule is if the catcher asks the home plate umpire to check with one of the umpires on a check swing, he must do it. It is not optional. And the breaking ball misses up high to Tettleton, one ball and one strike. So Mickey's only argument is with Rich Garcia. Rick Sutcliffe, seven and two, going after his eighth win. Down to first, fouled off, coming off the five-game suspension, an eight-day rest period for him. His first start since then. 
very effective tonight. Three walks and three strikeouts. He gets the victory here. He'll continue not having lost a game since the 27th of April. Chance to go 6-0 and with four no decisions in his last 10 starts if he gets the victory here tonight. That is some kind of pitching with an ERA of 4.70 coming into this game. They have scored a lot of runs for him this season. He's been the benefactor of the Orioles offense when it's been on. And again here tonight, 6-1. to one. That's basically the same type of season Jack Morris put together last year when he won 21. Once he got the lead, he didn't care so much about how many runs he gave up. He just wanted to win the game. That's the bottom line. 2-2 delivery to Tettle and leading it off in the ninth. See you later. Four strikeouts for Sutcliffe. The breaking ball, not exactly where Sutcliffe wanted it, but it was effective. Fifth strikeout for Rick Sutcliffe. He's looking at a complete game. Only been four on the season so far. Messina has three and Valenzuela one. He had five complete games last year, including two shutouts for Sutcliffe. His last shutout was a loss. July of last year he lost to Minnesota 5 2 in a complete game Rob Deere has taken the over here tonight batting at just 208 now down to third Leo Gomez oh the pick by Siggy Defensive plays like that take the sting out of a 210 batting average. Take a look at the reactions of Leo Gomez. Fans have been seeing great third base play for years here in Baltimore. Gomez gets an assist from David Segui at first, but what a fine play by Gomez. And they are up and standing at Camden Yards. Rick Sutcliffe, Scott Livingstone. Two down, ninth inning. Baltimore leads it six to one. A masterful performance. That's a base hit down the line. Livingstone. He'll make the turn and head to second base. McLemore will get it back in, and Livingstone has done his part. Three for four, double and two singles. The double coming to two down in the ninth inning. Well, Livingstone has had a great night here, but it hasn't been enough offense. This is the seventh hit that the Tigers have collected off Rick Sutcliffe. Sutcliffe, after spending five days on the suspended list, eight days since his last start, has been outstanding. Fans still applauding for that third out. Dan Gladden. Gladden towards the middle. He's got himself a base hit. Livingstone makes the turn. Devereaux will get it into second base. Livingstone will score. And it is a 6-2 to two ball game. The RBI going to Gladden, who's got his second hit. He's two for four in this game. And suddenly that two-run homer by Cal Ripken in the eighth inning looms a little bit larger, especially for Rick Sutcliffe. He probably wouldn't be in the ball game right now, but for the extra two. Johnny Oates and Dick Bosman are not going to allow Rick Sutcliffe to go too much further down in this lineup. Now they're at the leadoff spot with Tony Phillips up there in two outs. And once again, he has Brad Pennington down in the bullpen, and he appears to be ready. Dan Gladden picking up the RBI. Tony Phillips at the top of the order. There's Pennington, who's been up a couple of times during this game, so it won't take him long to get ready. I think if... Tony Phillips just weren't hitting 358 right-handed. We probably would have seen Pennington here already. 11 RBIs for Dan Gladden, who's on at first base. Tony Phillips waiting. Phillips grounds it down to first. Foul territory. Two strikes. The Detroit Tigers lost seven games here last year. They lost the first game played here last night. And Rick Sutcliffe is beating them right now, six to two. They're down to their final strike. Sutcliffe after the complete game, the 0-2 to Phillips. Oh, 
was a lot of talk that Sutcliffe wouldn't be able to repeat his 16-win season of last year. Second base, Harold Reynolds for the ball game. Sutcliffe wins it. A complete game win. Rick Sutcliffe is now eight and two. Mike Moore, the loser, is five and four. First complete game win of the season for him and a great performance. That's the final. Baltimore wins it by a score of six to two. I want to remind you, baseball tonight will be coming along as soon as we are done here. And on Friday night, first half of our Friday night doubleheader, it'll be these Baltimore Orioles and the New York Yankees for Buck Martinez. And Peter Gammons, this is Gary Thorne. Thanks very much for joining us, everybody. From Camden Yards, you're looking at the winner.